Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Good evening and welcome to Space Down Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate you tuning us on in on a very, very special night as we have our good friend Chris Bledsoe here talking about his brand new book, UFO of God. And we're going to get into that very, very soon. But first, let's say hello to all of you out there in Radio Land. We got Race Fan in the gold medal position and B with a silver. Bronze medal goes to Nightmare Tonight. Hi, Lisa C., Brown Dwarf, Penny Van, Gong Show, and Dogface Simon in Australia. Good to see you all. And there's D. Cohen, Kathy Evans, Donna Lair, Chill Farm. How are you doing in Brisbane? Chill Farm will be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Number 28 in your program, number one in your hearts, starting on defense from Stockholm, Sweden, Lars Janssen. There he is. Watch this, Jules. Good to see you. Human Carl, thank you so much for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. The Super Chat is a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you so, so much. Hi, Dave Walters. How you doing? And who else do we have here? Uh, let's scroll on down. And we have Rui from Portugal. Good to see you, my man. Susie B., thanks for coming on in. Hi, Pixie Lara. Thank you for joining us. George Hernandez. Sibylla Irwin is here. Sibylla will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio, if you don't mind, to the right of the studio. Hadley, thank you for joining us. Hi, Robert Lamoth. Linda Thompson, looking lovely tonight. Thank you for joining us. As we continue on with roll call, there's Monica. Thank you for coming on in. Uh, Johnny's Freeman, welcome to SOR Chat. Very much appreciate you tuning us in. Ozzy Ange, good to see you. And who else do we have here? We have Stargazer. And Linda, thank you so much for that super chat. Very much appreciate your love and support of SOR. And Glenn John McEnroe, good to have you here. The Pride of Wimbledon. Stacy D, welcome to SOR Chat. And who else do we have here? Let's take a look. We have Jessica S- Noble Patrick. Good to have you here. My man, Belenium P- Penny Van. Good to see you. Doug Shelby is here. The Doug Shelby has arrived, which means we can officially start this show. Serpent, welcome. Forrest Louie, good to have you back. Friend of Squirrel, thank you for taking the time as we continue on with Roll Call. Aunt Edna, thank you for joining us. And Mark Sanchez, how's the Hawaiian shirt tonight? Let us know if you don't mind. Let's continue on. Deb from SAC and the lovely Kira, welcome to the show. Chris716, thank you for joining us. Hi, Super Duke. Super Duke, the incredible Super Duke. And continuing on here, we have Sugar Bridges, the Mark W. Welcome to SOR chat. And uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Who else do we have here? Long Island Bigfoot. Good to see you. Richard Elmore. Juan Marquez. Welcome to SOR chat. And Pat Tui. Good to have you here as we continue on. Hi, Trisha. It's been a while. Nice to see you back. And Celine. Ozzy, Ozzy. Oi, oi to you, my friend. Tim Othman. Pink Volo. Thank you for joining us. Phil the Stalker, good to have you here as we continue on. Lee the Bee, nice to see you. Linda Bennett, nice to have you here. Digger Dog, GF, 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 G, good to see you. Meaty Toes and Candy Wolf, thank you for joining us. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Sandra. 
We're going to start the radio side here, so that way we can let Bill WD-40 into the Spreaker chat room to lube us up for tonight's show. Just watch. He'll be right there in a second. Maggie M10, good to see you as we continue on. Justin Chapker, your hair looks beautiful tonight. Thank you for doing it up. Uh, Bob Davis, good to have you here. Crystal J, thank you for joining us. And uh, will we run out of time? I don't know. I'm scrolling on down here. Timothy Fellin, good to see you. And I think we got everybody. Did we get everybody? Kevin WIFP, Renee, nice to have you both here. And uh, I think we're caught up. Stu Gerson, Plutarchos, welcome. Um, 10 seconds. Nine, eight. Hi, Heather McIntyre. Looking lovely tonight. See you in Vegas. And check off call. Welcome to SOR chat. Rest of you, horns up. Let's rock. of central british columbia to you listening around the world this my friends is spaced out radio i am your host dave scott sitting in the captain's chair of sor headquarters we welcome you to tonight's show and our terrestrial affiliates around north america digitally on odyssey radio talk stream live at kpnl all of our archives are free Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old baby the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at spaced out radio, Instagram at spaced out radio show, and on TikTok at spaced out radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. We got a fantastic show tonight. The legendary Chris Bledsoe is here to talk about his brand new book, his tell-all tale, UFO from God. Then in hour number three, we're going to head to the swamp and get a story from Swamp Dweller. Duke's here for the cryptid report. It's Dave 101 night, and we'll get to the weird news as well. Back on January 8th, 2007, Chris Bledsoe came face to face with a celestial being and had missing time. Although he wouldn't recall the details of that first terrifying encounter until under hypnosis a year and a half later, while on the banks of the Cape Fear River, Chris, his son Chris Jr., and three of his subcontractors discovered they were about to experience the most harrowing day of their lives involving unexplained phenomena leading them to believe this was the end of the world. MUFON sent their highest trained team to investigate the encounter, only to attempt to debunk and ridicule the Bledsoe family. Their experience was featured in the Discovery Channel's 2008 series, UFOs Over Earth, The Fayetteville Incident. Multiple three-letter agencies have now been involved with the Bledsoe case, bringing increased attention and mystery to solving this ever-evolving story in North Carolina. And Chris, because of this, has had his entire world changed. He's lost friends. He's lost people that he's trusted, much like many experiencers do. But his strength and conviction over what has happened in his life over the last 12 to 15 years has made him a better man, a more trusting man, a more God-fearing man. And it's turned out in the book, UFO of God. Chris Bledsoe, welcome back to Spaced Out Radio. It is so good to have you here. I know you've been traveling around North America here, doing a book tour, doing hundreds of interviews. And I want to say thank you for staying up late to join us again on Spaced Out Radio. It, the pleasure really is ours. And um, uh, I didn't want to miss your show. You and I met, what, in 2020? And um, we became good friends. And uh, I've been gone too long. Between writing this book and COVID and all that, i kind of uh, been hiding out. But now's the time. So uh, thank you for having me, Dave. I, I really appreciate it. For most of everybody in the UFO field knows your story. 
and uh, about going fishing. This scenario, this phenomena can happen anywhere. All you wanted to do was go fishing with your crew and your son. And it leads to a life-changing experience. Chris, looking back to 2007, I mean, we're in 2023 now. That's 16 years already. Yeah. Would you, Do you regret all of this happening? Or do you believe now, looking at everything that's happened, that this was your calling, your blessing? This was what your life was supposed to be about, a life of importance, telling this story. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I, there have been many times I regretted ever speaking about it. But um, today I know more than ever that um, I, I had to do what I had to do. I had to suffer through what I had to suffer through because the phenomenon is in control, total control. We have no clue to um, how complex it really is. And but it does control the show. It's like they're driving the bus. And um, in my book, if you read this book, uh, you can get a much greater understanding uh, about the phenomenon by reading it. And, and I don't go out and just try to say what it is. I let the reader figure it out for themselves. But looking back for 16 years, um, I'm I'm glad it all happened because uh, other lives have been touched and that gives me more joy for people to reach out and tell me that uh, they they received a blessing from this and so I know now that it all had to happen. You know. For you putting this on paper and getting it out there why did you feel the need to write a book about your story? Well, you know, it's something um, I thought about over the years and, and I actually started writing a book with um, begin with Michael O'Connell and he died really suddenly uh, just three years. He was a hypnotherapist on the History, uh, discovery channel. He was a call. He was a, a, a Harvard trained hypnotherapist trained by John Mack and, we actually started a book together and he passed away really suddenly. And then Diana Pasolka came and um, we started a manuscript and got well into it and that didn't work out. And so I kind of got discouraged and I just began a life of trying to help others that were sick. And I had no idea that's where I would end up, but because of an incident with Grant Cameron coming and, and Nelly, my dog, and, and some folks at NASA encouraging me to pursue that. And um, so I've gotten a lot of years helping people that needed hope when they had none and, and was able to give some that. And so, uh, you know, it wasn't until last year that my good friend David is also my manager. We're like best friends. I met him through Colonel John Alexander. And when I met him, uh, I write about him in the book. He's in the last chapter of the Monroe Institute. And uh, David and I connected on such a, an amazing uh, level with the phenomenon that I knew that he was guided to meet me, that there was no coincidence. And, and he comes saying, I want to help you. I want to help you get this book out. You've got to leave this for your children. They need, don't, don't you want your grandchildren to read about their grandpa one day? And he kept telling me this and telling me. And along about Easter of last year, uh, he became successful at encouraging me to start. And so I did. And uh, I would go to bed every, I'd go out every night and look at the heavens and say, give me the words, help me. I go to bed and get up every morning and start writing. And that's how it all came about. And from April until this past February 19th, it's been seven days a week uh, to get that book published and and all so for you to be able to get all of those stories all of those encounters 
all the names that have not only helped you, but tried to divert you in different ways. Was it a release for you of a lot of energy, a lot of emotion to bring this out and to finally get it off your chest from your words and not the entire UFO world's words? Yeah. And, you know, and I always knew one day maybe I did that because there's probably 12, 13, 14 books been published over the last 16 years. All these people telling my story, nobody asking permission. They just did it. And that's OK. It helped get the word out. But I, I always had that desire to to set the record straight. Uh so it comes from me and then tell some stories that nobody's ever heard because in this book, there's a lot of stuff. I promise you, uh, you can look me all over any podcast and you will not find what's in that book. There's a lot of names and there's some connections up in Washington, DC that um, I have revealed in this book that I was really worried about doing but I was only met with kindness from everyone. So yeah, it, it, it had to happen. And here we are. And Going back to the original incident before this happened, I know that you have always been a church man, a man of God, a God fearing man, very, very uh, tight with your, with your personal beliefs what did you know about UFOs and alien contact prior to this? Well, absolutely nothing. Um, you know, if you read uh, uh, the book, you can figure that out pretty quick. Uh, although when I was a little boy, um, one peculiar thing I did, my family couldn't understand it. I was obsessed with the moon, like severely bad. And I would draw circles on the ground. Um, some might call them flying saucers. I never really understood what it was. I believe they're like orbs maybe, but I would pretend to fly around in space and go to the moon. And all the other kids were playing hopscotch. And, you know, we we're on a, uh, on a farm where they had no grass. It was just dirt. And we would rake the yard and draw in it and we'd broom it out and pull what weeds up, you know, farm equipment kept it or trucks and cars. Uh, we didn't have a lawnmower. And uh, with chickens would pluck it up, if anything. But it goes back that far how mysterious it was. But I never I never thought about a UFO. Um, I, had four I had four children. And in those seven, when it happened, I had gone through losing a company that I'd had 19 and a half years that had made a lot of money but when desert storm came and, and they the world trade centers and all were destroyed that shut the market down in my town because it's fort bragg a military market va market and nobody was buying and i had 72 houses under construction and so i watched it all go away and um, i was sick i had what turned into crohn's disease and it gets worse the more stress you have the worse it got and so i was in a slow motion train wreck by the time 07 come around the whole economy had collapsed and here i find myself on the cape fear river with my son and three guys but i i wasn't fishing i never pulled out a pole i just was entertaining them because they had finished a project and and my son, he wouldn't leave my side because he felt like he was looking after me. I'd been so sick. And uh, that's when I walked away from the group that night, crying out to the heavens, whoever is up there, please hear me. What do I do? Here I am living in a 5,000 foot house with a pool in the yard. And now I'm living in a, a mobile home and, uh, having to get free lunches for my children so you can imagine going from there to that and not able to get a job um, because my sickness was such that um, you know it just wasn't possible for me to even be in the public i was in and out of the restroom 20 times a day debilitated so i was at the end of my rope i was thinking the unthinkable 
but so tight and loving with my children, I, I, I was agonizing to, to the heavens. Somebody help me, please. And that's when I walked away from the group for what I thought was 20 minutes, and I come back four hours later. And uh, the rest is history. The rest is definitely history. As you were uh, going through this, you obviously had to figure out what went on, what happened that night, because Chris Jr. Uh, felt he was being chased by a couple of greys. I believe yeah. he even saw, saw them. And as you started to try and figure out what was going on, did you contact MUFON right off the bat, or did somebody recommend MUFON to you? What did you do to try and deal with this? Well, um, Jenner never described them as greys. I've never seen anything like that either. They were small in stature, but they're these translucent beings that um, it's like if you had a rheostat on a, on a dimmer switch, you can turn a light down or brighten it up. Well, this is about what you're looking at, something that can be totally translucent. You can see their outline, but when they open their eyes, they're glowing red, right? But um, uh, I got sidetracked. Restate that question again. So well, in, re in regards to you had your experience, Chris Jr. had his experience. What was the next step? How did you go about investigating what had happened to you? Well, here's the thing. When I came home, um, my wife and children were, the other, we have four. So it was Junior and I until for three days until they came home. And I, I was not feeling sick anymore. I had been sick for so long that, uh, all of a sudden I'm not going to the restroom anymore and I'm not, I don't need my, to feel the need to take any more medication. And so I'm the happiest person. Oh my Lord, you got to hear about what I saw. And I started telling this to everyone, my community, friends, mother, dad, wife. And suddenly the whole world's like, Oh, you're either playing with the devil or you're crazy. And it backfired on me and because of the fear that my little children got from hearing this story my wife forbid me to talk about it because i'm scaring them and they can't function in school and we had enough stress and so i was kind of forced into depression into my room by myself for almost 10 months not talking about it i tried to be quiet uh what they did to me to block my memory created the worst headache in the whole world. If I tried to think about any of it, if anybody asked me a question, what happened while you were gone? I resisted the thought that I was gone, period. I fought with them. I fought with my son. There's not no way. Yes, you were. And after months uh, of everybody giving me detailed events of what they did, the truck was moved, the don't you remember you left at daylight and you come back after dark and it was ice, you know, I frost on the ground. So it took me a long time to come to terms that I was missing time. And um, finally I picked the phone. Uh, I mean, I didn't have TV. We couldn't afford it. So sitting in my room, not working, um, not sick at the time, but um I decided I had to have some sort of way to communicate with somebody. The whole world would, didn't want to talk to me anymore. So uh, we got internet at that time. And um, I went to searching for UFO stuff. And I found MUFON on a show called UFO Files. Dr. Um, was his name. He was the physicist. Kathy Martin's um, uh co-author Stanton Friedman well, Stanton Freeman. Yeah. I saw him on an episode of uh, uh, um, UFO files and I thought, well, if that guy is such a prominent figure believes in this stuff, maybe I can talk to the company he recommended, which was move on. And so I found him. I filled out a, a report form 
and I'm about to hit the button sin, and I had second thoughts. If I do this, I may lose my wife because she forbid me to talk about it. So for two more weeks, I struggled with that. And finally, when I hit send, within a day, I get a phone call from California. Oh, we just got to come see you. And I freaked out. I'm like, no, this is too real. I just felt good about sending it in the uh, you know, mail land, hoping somebody would read it. Um, or at least call and want to talk, not come to my house. So I told them no. That was in October. And come January, they reached out and said, well, since you don't want to talk, we're going to close the file. And I wrote them back and said, no, I want to talk about it. So they actually sent a guy. It was February by now. And uh, as soon as he came and did his report, uh, he saw the evidence. He saw the circles in the yard and everything that happened and heard all the people talking and there were eight other witnesses around the community. They never spoke about, they never wanted to talk to these people, but they all wanted to talk. Um, but yeah, that's when I decided to tell it. And, um, and they had discovery channel at my house within a couple of weeks trying to do a film. They came in, they investigated me and immediately they wanted to do a movie or a, a documentary, which I thought was, the right thing to do to help vindicate me and all the trouble and the laughing and turned out that was the worst thing I did. Um, Why do you think MUFON treated you the way that they did? Because they talk quite highly of trying to be the voice of the people yet in your situation, that wasn't the case. Well, I can tell you in 2007, uh, and eight, right on up to 2016, the UFO subject was the most highly classified subject on planet Earth. And all they are is data collectors. And never wonder why every all these field investigators, they get these volunteer people to go out and work for them and collect all the data. And, oh, I got a great case. And they turn it in and suddenly they can't find it anymore. And when they start asking questions, they get shut down. It's because they they classify the stuff. The government was taking it. They were working right straight for the government during those days. Now it's different. 2016, they told about it. I know for a fact, 100% sure what I'm talking about. And all those people were there or gone. They're not there anymore. And, and I'm not saying it's the the MUFON or the investigators, I've got a lot of great friends there and I'll still participate with them. Uh, but at that time it was classified and they just did probably what they were told to do is all I can say about that. Chris, we got about a minute to go before we got to go to break here, the bottom of the hour quickly here, looking at the, where things have gone up till now, are you happier are you are you more solid with your wife? Has your wife accepted everything that's gone on now? Oh, yeah. Well, she did early on. I mean, she had no choice. What happened is, if you read it, uh, the book, you'll find out that the phenomenon, the, the thing that happened actually caused our family to become isolated. And my wife was living in uh, two realities. She's living with her family in the Pentecostal Holiness Church. And then she had to come home and live with this family full of the paranormal. So think about that. That's not permitted in the Pentecostal Church. So it really was hard on her. And I realized that. But she did the best she could and to keep the family together. And she's been the rock. Uh, and I paint that about the, her in the book. But we're, we'll be married next month or uh, June 25th. We'll be 40 years this year. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Chris, I'm going to get you to hold on. We're through the first half hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight with the legendary Chris Bledsoe. In the next half hour, we'll talk about the phenomena and why the U.S. government paid attention to his story. Spaced Out Radio, UFO and God, coming up right after this. Beautiful. Yeah, we are clear. 
I just want to make mention, we got a lot of new listeners here tonight. And hello to everyone. If you could give us a thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, if you're new here and haven't yet, please uh, do us a favor, hit that subscribe button. So just to let everybody know, we are a hybrid YouTube podcast and live radio show. And with that, uh, you get to see behind the scenes of what we are doing right now uh, with Chris and myself as we go to break on our radio stations. So the fact is we have to take these radio breaks to time everything out so you get a little bit different of a show, but you get to, to see some stuff behind the scenes. So I hope you enjoy yourself. Uh, thank you for everybody coming on in. Maria Rose, welcome to SOR Chat. And who else has uh, stepped in here uh, just a moment ago? I saw a new name here. Oh, where is it? I like to, Chris, I like to say hi to everybody. It's just one of those habits that I have, you know. So, Lori, thank you for that super chat. Very much appreciate it, my friend. Yeah. So. Thank you, know, you, Lori. Lori Rosenfield, I'm reading your post there. It's beautiful. Thank you. I guess she can hear me. I don't know. Yes, she can. Pete Leibel, how are you, man? Good to see you. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, I actually did something for the first time tonight. I, I Before this show, I went on with uh, Steve Cambion on Truth Seekers to talk about uh, the UFO video that Sean Cahill put out. We had just an incredible discussion, incredible discussion about UFOs. And, and if you know Steve and I, we are both polar opposite. And I really admired his his great questions, his professionalism, and uh, I really appreciated it. And I see a bunch of uh, Steve l listeners giving us an opportunity tonight. So thank you so much for coming on in. Uh, Susan Halloway, thank you for joining us. Rowdy Dingo, welcome to SOR Chat. And uh, who else do we have that's coming on in new here? Christine Lynn, good to see you for the second night in a row. Nancy Thames, thank you for joining us. Uh, B. Baker, good to have you here. It's been about three years. Karen Riley, welcome back to SOR Chat. And let's see here. Who else do we have? Uh, I think uh, I think we are uh, uh, I think we're good. I think we're good. Oh, Kurt M. snuck in there. I just saw that. What temperature is it there right now, Chris? Oh, it's, uh, it was 80 all week, but tonight is probably uh, 46, high 61 today. Oh, that's T-shirt weather. Yeah. That that's, was 80. Oh, my gosh. I woke up this morning it, it, putting it in Fahrenheit. It was about minus 18 oh, Fahrenheit. And, wow. uh, but we're going to get into the, into the warmer temperatures here soon. And, uh, you know. Once it gets around that, that 32 degree mark, that's where we get into hoodie weather, you know, <laughs> start getting unbundled from all the heavy coats. So, oh, but I would do anything for like 60 degrees right now. Would do anything for that. You know, it was oh. strange. Leaving, leaving North Carolina and at 80 on, I left last Friday for Pasadena. It was 80 here. And when I got there, it was snow everywhere and cold. And it's usually the complete opposite, right? It's, more about there and cold here, but it was pretty crazy to experience that. Uh, I did something illegal today. Um, I uh, don't tell anybody, radio people, okay, or YouTube people, but I have deer that come into my yard. We're not supposed to feed them, but they're just so darn cute. I was feeding the deer apples today. <laughs> I don't come, mind. They'll come back for more for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, my partner, she um, she has them eating right out of her hand now. Wow. They're not used to that with me, but uh, with her, she can walk right up to them and, and, sh and they'll take apples right out of her hand and she can pet them and everything. And it's like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah, it's her she energy. Got, they know. Oh, it. oh, yeah. Bad cop, no donut. How you doing, man? Good to have you here. Thank you for joining us again. James Weston, good to see you. And sweet Tony D in the UK. Good to have you here. I will get to some questions for Chris. We, depending on how he's feeling, we, we got an hour with him 
And then we may, if he's feeling good, he's going to stay for maybe another half an hour. If he does that half an hour, I'll try and get you all of your questions. A big thank you so far tonight to Human Carl, Linda, Pam H, Noble Patrick, Espionage, Matt, uh, Maddie, pardon me, Kim, and Lori for the Super Chats. It's a wonderful way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you so, so much. We got about 10 seconds. Our store is open at spacedoutradio.com. I know Cambian's going to go buy himself a Wu Train t shirt. Uh, so here we go, everyone. The second half hour starts right now. half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. I very much appreciate earning your listening ears. I want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bubblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Chris Bledsoe is here tonight talking about his amazing story that he has now written, UFO of God. It's a book that many in the UFO world have been waiting for. This man has seen it, been there, done that, been tested by some of the best scientists in the United States, and the things he can do, all because of January of 2007. Chris, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. I want to, because we may only have you until the top of the hour, and I know you're, you've been struggling with, with your health and, and fatigue lately. I'm hoping that we can keep you a little bit longer, but if we can't, that is absolutely fine. So I do have a lot of questions to get for you this hour. When did the government find out about your story and take an interest in that because you have had alphabet agencies all around you and you're showing them what you could do. You've had uh, scientists from around every major academic university, almost in the U S have come and tested you, your family. How did that all start? Well, I'll tell you, um, it started the day I published or the, the day I hit send, when I sent that um, in October of 07, when I sent that report to move on, the CIA got it within minutes and they told me they knew it from the minute it was published. And um, but the first people to come were NASA. Um, and that was in 2008. You know, they didn't even investigate me until February of 08. And by June, there was NASA scientists knocking at my front door and in fact my son ryan answered the door and calls me i was not at home and he said dad there's this real big guy he's from nasa he wants to talk to you i said well tell him to hang around i'd be about an hour getting home well that guy was dr hal Povenmire, and he turned into uh, 11 years later he passed away which in 2020 he passed away he was coming here for thanksgiving with his wife but my children fell in love with him he come from cape canaveral several times a year he made their birthday parties he made emily's college graduation he wrote letters for him to get into college that's that was the very first one that showed up but um they just kept coming and And still to the day, I I meet more and more, and and I enjoy every minute of it. Who has been some of the most profound people who have been involved with your story? I know you mentioned Diana Pasulka earlier, and you've mentioned uh, somebody who who, uh, scares the daylights out of me in uh, in Mr. John. Oh, why why, why did I go blank on his last name? Alexander John, John Alexander. Uh, he intimidates the hell out of me, but uh, <laughs> but that's okay. You know how you know who are some of the more profound people that 
have really stuck by your side through this because I've heard some incredible stories about you. Uh, and I, I know a lot of them are true because people have been there when it's happened, whether it's science, Bob and, and the miracle you performed, uh, on his wife, or I remember, uh, Lori, <laughs> Lori telling me a good story about how you got, how you had been threatened that if you went to the West coast, you would be in trouble. And the next thing you know, you guys go out for dinner and there's suits everywhere making sure that you were protected. I mean, this is incredible, Chris. Yeah, I had a I had a phone call. Um, I was flying out to, to San Diego to meet our friend Lori. I didn't know you knew Lori, but uh, I had a meeting with some filmmakers and uh, Lori was involved in um, I got this invitation. They're paying for it all. They're going to fly me out. And I get a phone call. It was Thanksgiving that year. And it was a guy from the national reconnaissance office from Houston. And he calls me, Hey, Chris, how the heck are you? And I, we got to talking and having a good time. And he's like, what are you doing for Thanksgiving? Uh, Cause he's, he was lonely. He didn't have anyone. And, and I actually started thinking that maybe he mentioned he wanted to come see me. So I was going to invite him for Thanksgiving, but I said, I, I'm leaving that week to San Diego. And he's like, Oh, you can't go to San Diego. I said, why? He said, well, there's people that might just uh, not let you come back. You're not safe going out there. So he really scared me telling me this. And um, so I made a call to DC and I called my friend. And I don't need to say his name, but he's in my book in a big way. And I told him what my friend said. And he said, you go to San Diego and don't you worry one bit about it. I'll see to it that uh, nobody bothers you. And so when we landed there, Lori comes and picks me up. And a friend of mine, actually a friend from Pennsylvania, meets me in Atlanta. And we rode together from there. And he was my friend going with me to kind of keep an eye on me. So we get out at the, uh, out of the airport. We drive to the first restaurant, pull up to this, like a Denny's right near San Diego airport. And we're eating, right? And uh, Lori's children were there and they wanted to see some of what I had on my phone. So I pulled my phone out and when I hit, turned it on it's going crazy it's flashing on and going scrolling through and i'm like look somebody's messing with my phone um and they even recorded it on a video my phone scrolling when we opened the front door we were the only ones in there when it was late when we got in but when we walked out the front door there was a 45 foot uh, like a provost one of those million dollar um, motorhomes you see with the dual rear axles. It was solid black, black windows and had Homeland Security and letters about two, three feet tall written down the side. And out come these guys, men in black, you might call them. They were dressed in black. And they just looked at me and kind of nodded their head. And I got right in the car and left. And everywhere we went, they were somebody trailing me, keeping me near or monitoring the cause and the next morning my friend from washington calls me and says how's your trip going i said it's going great <laughs> it was funny but you know that's uh that was a wonderful experience you've talked uh, many a times on this show and and in other places about your relationship with jim semivan and getting to meet president obama during this time how did that happen well, I didn't actually meet President Obama, but um, he was briefed on me. And um, I was given the dinner napkin from the table that it happened at by Tim Taylor. But I met Jim. Jim knew about the incident when it happened. Of course, he was active duty and he couldn't talk about it. He couldn't meet me. His job wouldn't let him until he overtly retired. But I write about this in the book. It's very important. If you really want to see how deep the rabbit hole goes, read the part about me meeting Jim uh, after um, uh, 
Well, let's just say somebody calls me and wants to fly me to Washington because there's a little boy from a very prominent family that had a make a wish by President Obama. He went to him and and asked, uh, he was given a wish. What would you want? They thought he was going to die. He, he, he had a feeding tube. He wasn't going to make it to 13 years old. And so President Obama allowed him to get with like the Delta Force and they went in the Pentagon basement and, and played war, played army because his, his little wish was I'd like to be an army man. So they let him play army with the elite force down in the basement. And, and of course, Mike Morrell, the deputy director of the CIA, wrote about him, put him in the book. There's a picture of him in there. And I got to meet all these people and um this little boy's in college now he's going to be a junior this year and that's how the biggest part of all these people found out about uh you know i can't say much because it's in the book yeah i don't want to give the story away but it goes deep it goes clear up to the top and they got to see some of this it is yeah my goodness did you yeah. ever when did you notice that you had healing abilities well if anybody knows about grant cameron a researcher from canada grant he's pretty famous in the ufo world in 2013 he in may of 2013 right after easter i had an experience in 2012 with the lady and then again, uh, Easter of 2012. And then again, Easter of 2013, she came back. And two weeks later, Grant was at my house. And, um, of course, my dog was injured really bad, cut across her neck right here, uh, cut this long. And it was wide open, deep, and her, when she was bleeding to death. And... Um, I had no idea. I thought she was dying. She's going to die. She bled all over the floor, all over the patio, all in Grant's pants. When she walked by, blood just went all over his pants. And and there was six or seven kids and their friends and Grant, and all of us out on the patio saw it. And she ran in the house and was bleeding all over the floor. And I ran in slipping and sliding and got her out the door and laid her on the ground and put my hand on her neck holding pressure just to try to stop the bleeding and as she was uh you know her heart would pump the blood was coming up through my fingers it was real it was greasy and grant's documenting this with a camera he's sitting right there watching it all and i realized she was going to die there wasn't no hope for her there wasn't no calling an ambulance what happened was supernatural and it was all meant to tell me the path I needed to take. And it was NASA friends that told me that when it happened. But as soon as I laid my hand on her and realized she was going to die, I just looked up at heaven and said, God, what do I do? How do I help her? Because I love this dog uh, and all animals. But immediately she just quit struggling and her body went limp. And I felt this calmness come through me to her and when i lifted my hand the cut was gone the bleeding was not there anymore she stood up and waggled her tail and walked away and all everybody saw it and that that is what got me to washington to help this little boy everybody heard about it it was witnessed and and after that point is when I knew I didn't care about going on the UFO circuit and telling anybody. I only had one thing in mind, and that's help those that were sick, that needed help. And, of course, I can't help everybody, and it's not me. I, I'm not saying it's me. I just asked them. It's like an intermediary. I don't feel like I can do anything, but I can connect to to uh, the heavens or to the this spiritual place you also helped dr bob mcguire's wife ex-wife uh heal from the effects of a stroke yeah bob has told that story many a time to our audience where all of a sudden he started feeling rain 
drops falling from his ceiling in his house. Yeah. He actually hired a plumber to come in and check all the piping. And there hadn't been rain there in two weeks. And yet here you were, uh, you know, performing this, this uh, miracle, if we could call it that. I mean, Chris, there, these types of things for many people are so subjective. And there, there's always people who are going to critique that. You know, because the first thing they'll usually ask is, why you? Why were you chosen to do this or to or to help people, you know, heal or get better? Have you ever found the answer to that? Because I know you've been tested on this. Yeah, I, I don't know why. I have no clue. But I can say this. And um, for the person that reads this book, we'll see a lifetime of weirdness and um, a lot of tragedy. For example, just one incident at 10 years old, and it started when I was two. That's how early these tragedies started. But at 10, I was shot in the back point blank with a shotgun. 350 pellets went in my back, blew a hole in me this big. Now, at 10 years old, I'm a little bitty guy. So imagine an orange size hole in right here, right in my shoulder, right there. And I have lead all around this. I set the machine off at the airport. When I go through it twice this year, this week, they pat me down because their scan machine detects this metal. And it's like I might have a gun or something. I'm like, no, this is an old gun wound. Well, that usually gets TA, TSA to smile and say, thank you. You know, they think I'm military or something, I guess. I don't know. But um, I've thought all my life because of this weirdness that has happened that something was out to stop me from doing. I, the only thing I could rationalize with myself is why are these strange events? I feel like something's trying to kill me. And, and early on, I thought, well, maybe one day I'll understand. Maybe it's all for something. And I'm realizing now that I believe there's been a force around me kind of keeping me from from uh, I, I should have been dead a long time ago from and it's in the book you'll read about it if you read it and it, it adds more uh, understanding to the whole phenomenon if you start from the beginning and right right now from what I had read and heard that a lot of these healings and, and I, I'm going to assume just naturally some of them didn't work because right. you're not going to be a hundred percent each time. Exactly. But I did hear that your abilities did catch the eyes of, of people and, and uh, theologists and, and everybody at the Vatican as well. Yeah. It but did. I heard that from you. Yeah. They, they investigated me uh, along with uh, every other agency you can think of. And even the Southern Baptist church and different, uh, people now are starting to reach out about it, but I'm just a simple country boy from North Carolina that um, something weird happened to, and I wasn't afraid. I've never been afraid. It's, I walked up the hill and I saw it. I got scared because I'm I'm a commercial pilot. Uh, I was. I still have my tickets. I just don't have a medical, but I knew exactly what I was seeing wasn't from here or anything we had. <clears throat> and it scared me bad. But when they brought me back, I wasn't afraid. And the whole time I'm with my son and these three men, they were terrified. I'd been gone for hours. They were scared looking for me. And then when these things showed up and landed across the river, we left out of there. They were everything from crying to shouting to just take me home. I want to see my family for the last. And I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend why are they so afraid? This is where my mind was. So they took the fear from me that night. They took it from me. And uh, this summer, there's a new history channel series coming on. And uh, I would uh, tell everybody to, I can't say what it is, but they're going to feature me and at least three of my children in it. Uh, my fourth one couldn't get off from his university job, but I think um, you might hear about what I just said in 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 that uh, 
series. One one question I do have for you regarding the healings. When when you are performing these, are you filming these? Are you getting them on the record? Oh yeah, I film. I have two thousand videos I've taken in the last 16, 18 months, and and it happens when multiple. There were 25, 30 people here. Um, you know, when the History Channel was filming, there were a lot of people here, a lot, and we had numerous objects. Many as thirty-five one night just showed up. Boom. So, um, yeah, I've documented it more than probably most anybody anywhere. And that's why the government's been involved the whole time. It never quit coming. They knew that they could see it with me or study it here. And um, so I kept quiet about it. I just didn't, you know, I'm getting blasted on the Internet about, you know, you this or you that or I don't believe you or your videos dust. But they only knew who was standing with me when I took that, right? And the equipment that that verified it was unknown and this kind of thing. So I just ignore it all. And 15 years, I've been um, quietly gathering the data, sharing it with friends and people like Bob and Jim Simi Van and John Alexander. John wrote a book, Reality Denied. I'm in the second chapter. He was with me when we were standing at this very same spot I was taken in. We were sitting there by the car. I'm leaning against the door, and he's leaning against the hood beside me. Emily's in the back seat with the door up and then her feet out. Victoria's in the back on the other side with the door closed. But uh, I'm talking to John, and uh, this was in October of 2015. It's in the book. And um, I'm tuned to nature in a huge way. I hear it, I sense it, I, uh, I hear the bugs and the crickets, and suddenly it all stopped, and I heard it. And I sensed the phenomena. And I looked at John and Emily, and I said, it's here, it's right there right now. And when I pointed up, it appeared within 10 seconds of me saying it, it appeared, this huge ball of light. It sat there flashing on and off, and then it shot off to the south like out of a cannon. And John's like, oh, my God, you should hear him. And he writes, uh, his he, the whole second chapter is about his experience with me on the river there. And really changed his life. He and I are great friends. I mean, he's a, he's a big teddy bear. He's a scary one. You know, he scares people. He's so serious looking. And, but he's really a nice guy. And, I mean, really, he is a nice person. He likes my children. He acts as if he really cares for them. He calls and checks in. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't want to keep rambling on you. Oh, you're doing great. we got about 90 seconds to go here. You know, for people who may be looking for your book, where can they find it? Where's their best place to get a hold of it? Well, uh, you can get it straight from Amazon, but if you go to ufoofgod.com, which is my website, you can purchase it. There's an Amazon button there to take you straight to it. But the cool thing is um, we have a lot of testimonials from like Jim and from John and from uh, professors and other guys, Rob Freeman, his experience with me at the Monroe Institute filming it. And he and I had a really good uh, experience where when we hugged, immediately it appeared and it stayed there a whole hour. And he filmed it a whole hour. The star field moved, but the object never moved. And it was a true unknown. But um, ufoofgod.com. And it's, there's a lot we're going to be putting on there. Um, we're going to probably offer some signed copies on that website. We hadn't got to that point yet, but we're working on it. And maybe a few videos will end up on there. And um, But you can go straight to Amazon. And if you can't get it on Amazon, there's other ways, you know, Apple Books or, uh, you know, like in the U in um, Ireland and places, you can't get a hard copy. Chris, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are through the first hour of Spaced Out Radio. And while he was speaking, I went to Amazon and bought my own copy. It's just that easy. Go to UFO of God. 
Radio.com. Chris Bledsoe, everybody. Coming up next, more Spaced Out Radio. Stay tuned. You want to do another half hour? I'm down. Okay, let's do it. We'll do another half an hour. I do have some audience questions here for you as well. So this is awesome. Absolutely awesome. And yes, I, I actually just purchased my copy. Wow. It'll be Thank here you. on March 22nd. Wow. Yeah, when you read it, you'll learn a lot. You you won't be, you won't believe. I've never told all this stuff. And this is a kind of a tell all book. And it goes clear to the top. Oh, very much so. Chris, I'm going to put you in the green room for right now. Uh, I'm just going to run, take a break. we got about another five and a half minutes here before we're going to come back. Audience, you stay tuned. Uh, we will be right back. So uh, just give us a couple minutes. Thank you. I am back. UFOofgod.com. I've typed it in the chat room. If you want to go and order your book up for Chris. Chris, we brought you back here. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Jacqueline, welcome to SOR Chat. And uh, we're going to have Chris until the bottom of the hour. And then we're going to break it all down. Thornblaze Lash, welcome to SOR Chat. Thank you for joining us. Pink Volo, good to see you. You know what? I'm going to be honest with you, Chris. 
when I first started having my experiences, when they started getting heavy with um, the ET side of things, hi, hiking deep. Welcome to SOR chat. Um, I was put in a bright white room and they told me that I, they didn't want me reading any more books, but I'm going to break that after, after nine years, I'm going to break that and I'm going to read yours fully front to back. I've, I've checked out a number of them. I've, I've checked out a lot of your information and everything. And I know your story pretty well, but I'm going to break that. Well, I appreciate that a whole lot. And uh, I hope it, I hope it has some parallels and um, can answer a few questions because that's, I'm, I'm getting a lot of people to write me saying, thank you. You've helped me understand what's happening to me. And that's kind of what I'm good. Uh, happy to, to be here for, you know, good. I'm going to get you to hold on one second. A big thank you to Carl, Linda, Pam, Noble, Patrick, espionage, Maddie, Kim, Lori, Gizmo, Thomas, uh, Plutarchos and Rob for the amazing super chats. It's a great way to support what we do. Our store is open at spacedoutradio.com and you can go there 24 seven and get your swag. And uh, we have Chris for another, uh, just until the bottom of the hour here. And, and uh, we're going to, we're going to try and get in as many questions as we can from you guys. I'm going to take a break, go straight on your questions. Here we go with the next hour, everybody. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America digitally on odyssey radio talk stream live at kpnl all of our archives are free join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio do old davy the favor hit that subscribe button the desert clam has set the password for tonight in the sor space travelers club Quodamo dotative Quodamo dotative is your password use it wisely space travelers as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on spaced out radio our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Author, experiencer, Chris Bledsoe. He is our guest tonight. We have him till the bottom of the hour here where we are going over his brand new book, UFO of God. You can go purchase it like I did at ufoofgod.com. Chris, thank you so much for being here with us. I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me today. All right, let's get to some audience questions here. And we're going to start off with ESPNage or Espionage Academy. What's flying the craft like? And have you experienced a Merkaba? Uh, your son mentions a spiky craft from the river might have been the one on his podcast. Uh, well, it's, um, it's, it's very complex to even consider thinking this, but I, I do have direct memories of being inside of the, it's an orb. It's not like a craft. It's not like a machine to me, even though they could be. But being inside of one is like looking through glass. You don't see walls or floors. It's just you're just like floating in the sky. And wherever you look, you go. And it's it, it's been uh, that way from the very beginning. When they took me in 04 for four hours, all I can tell you is I'm standing up and I've got my hands against this wall that's clear. I can touch it, but I can't see it but I always had this presence behind me. It's just like they were um, narrating everything that I'm looking at. So that was, that was pretty crazy, but it's, it's the best way I can tell it. Let's go to another question from Steve here. 
have you ever taken a hair sample and picture from Christopher Gray? I don't know if I have or not. I, I get, I don't know. I don't know who Christopher Gray is. Maybe something someone sent me. Um, I get a lot of stuff. I have no idea where, uh, you know, I don't know who Christopher Gray is. All right, no problem. Dr. Robert Steers is asking, Chris, do your experiences travel with you? Absolutely, they do. Um, doesn't matter where I am. Uh, California, Michigan, Las Vegas, Pennsylvania, my yard, you know, your yard, it doesn't matter. It's the same sky. They're everywhere. They're, they appear wherever I go. It's not about the land at all. It's, is is with us always with us gizmo would like to know how's the activity around your house now well tonight i walk out and um i'm in my little workshop and uh as i'm standing out front of my door here uh, i just give thanks to the the stars uh to the to that uh to them which i know they're always there and as soon as i did uh, an orb come out of the tree next to me big pine trees about 40 feet away and it went straight across in front of me 25 30 feet from me and went through the next pine tree and a couple of more and then it went on out of sight but it's every uh, you know it's it's it's, it's exponentially a hundred times greater than it ever has been right now. It, it is growing and is growing. And I don't know where it's going to stop until we have a handshake and a meet and greet, which I think is coming. I really believe there's something so spectacular that's going to happen. And I'm going to film it on the ground that, that everybody's going to have to pay attention to. And I've warned the people in high places that's coming as well. What do you what do you think is coming? I think there's a um, I call it an Elijah moment to where we're gonna have a meet and greet. In other words, there are beings in these orbs. There are beings in there. They, I've seen them and I have filmed them. Uh, we've all seen them here on my property, and um, I have them on video coming out of orbs. But I think it's going to be something more spectacular. Um, like a hello, you know, a greeting. I just predict that. Um, All right. Let, let's go to Jeremy here. Do you ever think the people from the government were feeding you disinformation? Never ever crossed your mind? Well, no, because I'm not asking them for information. They're coming to me. And that's how it started. Uh, when NASA first came, they came and I asked them, I'm down in mission control, the most sophisticated, the, the highest security place in, in the planet is mission control. They have machine guns pointing at you from both directions when you go in there. And you have to get clearances and background checks and all. And I, I did. Uh, but I asked them, I asked Tim Taylor which I introduced to Diana Pasolka, by the way. She was just a school teacher here in the local college and started investigating UFOs, and I'm hanging with NASA. And so I introduced her to that. That's how she got started into the Taylor thing. But I asked him, I said, why is it? And even before him, how? Bob and Mar, he was at my house in 08. Why do y'all need me? You've got all the greatest telescopes. You got all the money that you need or can get your hands on. You got planes and cameras and rockets and space stations. Why do you need me? And it ever every time it's like, well, we see it. We know it's there, but it don't have anything to do with us. But we know it likes you. And uh, if you would allow us, we'd like to study it with you. And early on, they told me, do not go to UFO conventions. Do not uh, study other people's experiences because we want to, to see yours unfold and it be your experience. We don't want you taking on somebody else's ideas or whatever. So I agreed to it and early on. And that's why you never saw much of me anywhere in any of these conventions. 
because I tried to keep my experience mine without taking on others. And so they always come to me to study it. It wasn't them trying to tell me anything. They come to me asking questions and they still do. They don't know what it is. I can tell you the government has not a clue how to tell this. And uh, I'm doing the telling what they don't know how. I'm letting information go that they don't know how to tell the public. So, um, and I don't think they ever will tell it because they don't know. They don't know what it is. It's too complex. Um, what is that message? Well, I, 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 the only thing I can tell you that I'm gathering from this, and I told them, the phenomenon told me we're going to wake the, the planet up. We're going to, whether they like it or anybody likes it or not, they're going to reveal themselves. And they're going to do it over a certain amount of time. And I told this in 2019 and 2020 when I first met you, uh, that this being come out of the space and landed on my pond, stayed here a half hour. I filmed it for almost 18 minutes. I have it on film, 25 feet from me. And that was in Easter of 2019. And that's when immediately I come out of hiding and I did 10 interviews in a row. And I met you, the last one, was the 10th one in San Francisco. And I was telling them, lock your doors, store up, because trouble's coming. This is what this, this being told me. I had no idea when I got home, COVID was hitting. Um, immediately COVID came. But that's what I was telling them. I said it in many interviews. And the biggest thing it told me is... We're going to let you, allow you with camera and with witness, help reveal us to the world. And I was saying that in 2019, every single interview, I said that. And suddenly, all I had was a cell phone, right? Suddenly, I got night vision cameras that just come magically appearing in my mailbox. I got two of them. And this Nikon, $1,000 Nikon cameras and all. And some guy was trying to give me a big tooth. Two thousand dollar drone just recently, and another camera. So it just started showing up, and the phenomenon started growing exponentially, and um, it's never stopped. That's why I say something's going to come much greater than we've seen so far. A meet and greet, I think, possible. Wonderful. Let's move on here. Let's go to Science Melinda in Australia. Chris, do you feel different when you do a healing? What do you experience personally? Well, I don't feel like it's me doing this. I think it's the phenomenon. And I just simply act as an intermediary. I ask them if it be your will, this person has cancer or this person has emotional problems or OCD, uh, uh, trauma, PTSD. I've seen healings from, and that can be just as bad as, you know, having a sickness. And I always take it to the heavens or to this um, spiritual force and ask them if they would do this. And uh, I do feel different. I feel at ease. Um, this calmness, this pure calm. Anytime the orbs come and their presence, my body goes into a different um, calmness. And they detected that here recently while the orb appeared next to us, 40 feet away. So it was uh, witnessed and filmed and all. And a brain scan done on me at the same time. They did this at the Monroe Institute. It's in, it's in the book, uh, one of these experiments. Let's continue on here. Let's go to Michael. <coughs> what, is the, what is the purpose of contact and spectacular healings in your opinion, Chris? Well, um, I'm not sure. I think the phenomenon um, is trying to put forth a message to the, to the people. I think it's been labeled negative for the last 15, 50 years, maybe. People's afraid and there's, uh, it's been labeled a negative by a lot of people. Um, and there's not been a whole lot of positive about it. And, um, but I have a front row seat. I can back up 
my experiences with video and witness and that's pretty powerful and uh, and i would just say that it has an impact on those seeking the positive side it's not that i'm trying to change anybody i'm just simply laying out what happened to me over the last 16 years or most of my life and how it affects others around me and it seems to it seems to spread it seems to have a a, a great um, personal um, people can relate to it a lot of people relate to the positive side of it so but it's i'm just simply telling what's happening all right let's continue on here let's go to meaty toes in toronto is it true that tim taylor showed you a video of a ufo shooting down a nuclear missile test yeah and it wasn't a live nuke it was a mocked up version nobody knew that but that's what was on board and I asked him, I said, why did that happen? Did you have a weapon on there? And he said, well, yeah, but it wasn't a live weapon. It was a, just a mock. Well, they didn't like it too well. Where did that happen? Uh, it happened out over California. The Pacific wow. Ocean. Yep. That is crazy. Well, there's a lot of them that's mysteriously exploded. Much like every rocket that we send to space seems to have a tag along with it. They all do. They come to check it out to see if it's got a weapon on there. If it does, they, can, they don't like it. They know everything. They know everything we see and think, and they know how we're going to react before we react. There is no uh, understanding this phenomenon, not in our simple minds for now. Greatest, a PhD means nothing with this phenomenon absolutely nothing all you can do is theorize a little better and write papers but until you experience it and live with it you really don't have a clue i mean it's hard to understand even for does me it, i don't does it make you i don't want to use the term laugh but maybe snicker a little bit when you see all these ufo groups popping up and they're all about the nuts and bolts and we have to get the science of this and it's all about propulsion and it's all about anti-gravity and in reality people such as yourself and many others who are multiple experiencers will say they're looking in the wrong direction well you know i was the lonely dog in the wilderness in 16 years ago because when mufon came uh they wanted to know when they were filming the show, what it was I thought really happened. And I said, well, I was sick. I was crying out. I was praying. And the UFOs came. And I'm not sick now. Maybe they were angels. I said, they have to be some kind of angelic being of some sort. They looked at me and said, well, that's just too too much for us. And they they left and I never saw them again after they got what they wanted and um so i went I, i've never wavered in 16 years i've told every time people would talk about pleiadians and this and that and i'd say well, it's spiritual for me i don't know about that and um i think the world's waking up to that side that it is spiritual and the nuts and bolts thing people think that because of technology because they see a physical thing they believe it has to be alien, but it's not, not in my opinion. I, I really don't know. All right. Let's get to more questions here. Cause we got about five minutes. I'm not going to get through them all. Uh, let's go to Tim here who is asking what or who do you interpret the lady to be? Well, um, after much study, um, you know, I, I'm a Baptist Pentecostal guy. Uh, well, I married into that. I was raised Baptist, but I believe that uh, it's very likely to be the same lady as the Fatima lady or the Guadalupe or the Lord's France. Uh, the Catholic Church seems to think it's the Mother Mary. Of course, I, I don't know. Uh, to me, it was a, it was a spiritual thing. Uh, it was like uh, a spirit. It came out of nowhere. And um, so it, it was... It was it was a divine being, but I'll stop short of labeling who, but it's possibly the same lady. I'm sure 
at least I think, is the same lady the children saw in Fatima. And um, there's a lot of controversy about who she really was and how she was dressed and what really happened there. Um, All right, let's continue on here. Silent Listen is asking, do you ever hear beeping sounds coming from nowhere in particular? I have before, uh, not often, but yeah, I've heard uh, sounds like that. I always hear crickets. Ever since my experience in 07, this overwhelming sound of nature, like if you live on a pond and you got frogs and you hear all that, that's what my ears sound like 24-7. I can't hardly get it out of there. It actually affects my hearing. Really? It's like a high frequency, yeah, but it's, it sounds like crickets, like like nature. And when that gets stronger, I know they're near every time. Pink Floyd's, is there anybody out there for me? Yeah. They always give you a sign. Yeah. They always do. Let's go to Jules here. Do you think the phenomena is part of Mother Earth's operating system communicating with those who can listen? Yeah, absolutely, I do. I really do. I think it's part of this this operating system. It's part of a mutualism, uh, you know, where your your stomach can't digest plant uh, chlorophyll, but your stomach has bacteria in it that digests it for you, and they give you the nutrients. So it's a mutual relationship, and um, I really think that it's part of an operating system. This this simulation. I believe we're in a simulation. Honestly, let's continue on. We got about two two and a half minutes here. Let's go to Bama. Chris, have you ever tested them and asked if they were from God or Jesus Christ? Absolutely, a hundred percent, and all the time. All if right. It, if it wasn't from God, I wouldn't be dealing with it. To me, uh, it's connected to the creator some way. All right, let's continue on here. Try and sneak in as many questions as we can. Dave is asking, why do you think more people are not contacted, overwhelming the government? Um, because they're, they don't want to go against their free will and you got to be introduced to it and then you got to seek it. So until you're introduced and, um, if they just showed up, it'd scare everybody to death and they, they wouldn't get the, you would never understand who they are. I think when people see it, they're afraid and their minds go crossways and they never really connect on who these beings really are. Um, so it's baby steps. And I think this awakening is, is just part of it. We all have to, to be introduced to it. Bally blue is asking, did they say they would stop any nuclear strike? They didn't tell me personally, but I've seen it in visions. Yes. Excellent. In fact, in fact I talked about that uh, way back, about seeing certain things happen and the sky suddenly light up with orbs everywhere and it stops everything. But, you know, I can't guarantee that at all. All I can say is I've seen that. Yeah. Xavier, we'll have to get to the final question here. Will we be seeing more from the Bledsoe family regarding disclosure? I think you will. In fact, I'm sure you will. Um, uh, at least I feel like it. There's a lot of things happening. Um, There's several motion picture companies entertaining us right now, and I don't know if any of that happens. It may or it may not. Uh, it's like rolling dice. But there are other things happening, other doors opening. And I think, yeah, I think we're going to be around for a long time. Awesome. Chris, it is such a pleasure to have been able to speak with you again. And thank you so much. I know you're really tired and I know you've been going through a lot this last week. But to stay up for our audience here on Spaced Out Radio again is a true testament to the person you are. Thank you so, so much for this, my friend. Yeah. I really appreciate you, and I appreciate everybody out there. Um, thank you, and uh, thank you for your support. And I would love to come back on again. Uh, just bring me up, and I'll be here. 
Thank you, my friend. We love you so much. And good luck with your new book, UFO of God, at ufoofgod.com. You can get it there or on Amazon. Coming up next, we're going to talk experiences. Why do we believe them? Why do we not? Your questions as well on Spaced Out Radio. Stay tuned. Great job, Chris. Great job. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, Dave. I really do. Um, and I appreciate you understanding, you know, oh, my no. energy levels is gone right now. No but problem, my man. And thank, you, Dave, that, thank uh, you to David for getting everything set up and everything. He did great. Uh, definitely. I'll let him know here in the morning for sure. He's probably listening right now, I'm sure. <laughs> we'll let you get some sleep, my friend. You All take right, care. Dave. Thank you. Take care. Much love. Chris Bledsoe, everybody. So what we're going to do here in the next half hour, okay, is we're going to talk experiences. And I want your questions about whether it's Chris Bledsoe, whether it's about experiences in general. Why do we have such a hard time believing in them? Why do we have such a hard time in understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, in understanding that this phenomena is currently taking place. Trot Dog, how you doing, man? Rocket Diner, good to have you here. You know, so let's get into it a little bit. All right, let's have some fun with it. We're going to do this for about half an hour, and then we're going to uh, go to uh, Swamp Dweller and Super Duke to kick off hour three. How about it? Can we do that? <clears throat> I think it'd be a fun time. That's me. Hopefully you guys think the same. Just setting up the weird news here. <clears throat> All right, that's good. Get rid of that. And who else has jumped in here that I haven't seen? Mystics Walk. Cryptid 559er, how are you? Gyro, how are you? Good to see you. Jay Burke, nice to have you back. Uh, if you have questions... Put them in capital letters. Debbie Nickerson, been a long time. Thank you. Warden Dragon, where have you been hiding? Oh, I'm glad it helped, Warden. Good for you. <clears throat> want to say a quick reminder to everybody that uh, our second annual Las Vegas fan party is happening at the Golden Nugget May 19th through 21st. And we'd love all of you to be there. We put up a schedule on our events page on, on our uh, Facebook. And we've got a bunch of cool guests coming in. So we need everybody who is emailed in to info at spacedoutradio.com. That's info at spacedoutradio.com. And we have uh, got a bunch of you who have replied so far. We're still waiting to hear from all of you regarding VIP tickets or tickets in general. We'd like to get the VIP tickets uh, paid for and accounted for by April 1st. Hi, Logan L. How are you? So that way we can have official numbers on um, how many VIP packages and swag bags we are creating for you. It would really help us get that number. I did a quick check today on our great list of guests. Let me get this for you. If you want to come, this is going to be great, by the way. Fantastic. All right. Oh, uh, and we got time. Cool. Okay. Here's our list of guests who are showing up to hang out with you guys. Merle, our paranormal friend. Geraldina Roscoe, 
from the Bigfoot world, Carter Bouchard and Bigfoot Rob. Uh, I believe the Crypto Guru is coming. Brian Bowden, Varla Ventura, Science Bob, Lala Bryant, Joe Mergia, Tim Senor, Michael Schratt, Melinda Leslie, Lorian Fenton, Misha Johnson, maybe Grant Cameron. Jim Goodall will be there along with uh, Ben and Joe from UFO Garage. Matt Ford is likely coming, same as Walter Bosley from Hoodoo Tall uh, documentary series, Damian J and Jurgen Hess. And random guy is going to be there. And we're still looking for more. We may add more to that list very, very soon. Once again, go to info at spacedoutradio.com. You can check the ticker below if you're watching on YouTube. We'd love to have you guys there. Everyone's invited. That's the beautiful part. Everyone is invited. So come join us in Las Vegas. We have an experiencers meetup. We got a live YouTube show. We got a VIP party, a night sky watch. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. All right. Experiences and experiencers with UFOs. There are a number of people who listen to this show who have seen lights in the sky, but there is a real difference, in my opinion, between those. And those who have not. What do I mean by that? Well, let's get into it. Lights in the sky is one thing because it could be human, could be a you know man-made satellite, could be some sort of space junk that is out there. Could be UFOs. But on the flip side, those who have experienced contact with the phenomena extraterrestrial contact wherever they are from it's a whole new ball game some people suffer missing time some people have time skip on them some people have claimed to be on craft where they've actually been asked to take a seat and fly the ship much like the disney movie flight of the navigator for many people out there it is a very very tough tough market to read because it seems impossible. It seems like people are storytelling right out of a sci-fi movie for attention and maybe 15 minutes of fame. But for those who have experienced the phenomena up close and personal, where they've woken up on the table with little gray dudes working all around them or humanoid type beings very interested in everything from body hair to clothing to people who have a claim to get back from a spaceship only to be wearing clothes that have never been part of their wardrobe before it is scary for a lot of people because they don't understand what truly is happening somebody like chris bledsoe who we just had on is much different He's in an upper echelon of what has gone on. And whether you believe him or not, his videos can be found on his social media. By the way, just look up Christopher Bledsoe Sr. Google him. They're right there. Chris always seems to have some sort of big name witness with him, whether it's university scientists, whether it's government agents. They seem very interested in learning why this is going on. So why do we have, as a public, such an affinity not to believe these stories? Why do we tend to believe that many of these stories are just bogus? 
Is it because we can't get our mind around the fact that they are out there? They being the extraterrestrials, the aliens, whatever you want to call them. Is it the fact that it just brings up a lot of fear? I think it's a combination of everything. People who just don't want to believe, people who are five senses, people who are naive to the fact that maybe we are not alone. There's a lot of it out there. As an experiencer myself, it makes me wonder at times what I've experienced, how real was it? Or in the end, was it just a dream? Let's go to YJ Overlander. He's got a great question. Dave, if you could remember 100% of your ET experiences, would you? Why or why not? That's a question that could be asked to anybody out there. And I encourage questions regarding contact and the ET phenomena. Why do you believe or why don't you? If you're in our chat room, type in your question in capital letters. We'd appreciate it. YJ, I think that is a very, very tough question to answer because I don't know if I would want to know full on what happened. In certain situations, I would. Okay? In certain situations, I think it would be cool to know. But in a couple of the situations where I have a little bit of recall that were very scary, I never want to think of those events again. Ever. I don't care if they were just a dream or if they were truly physical. I just don't want to deal with it again. I don't want to be tortured. I don't want that nightmare or the PST that may come along with it. Right. But is this phenomena truly an religious experience? Much like Chris was saying. For some, it probably is. For others, I don't think it is. I really don't. The phenomena has a weird way of showing each and every one of us what it wants from us. Sometimes it's insane. Sometimes it's a religious experience like what Chris has. Thank you, Obi Flett, by the way. Very much appreciate your serious love of this show. I just don't know how to put it. For me, I wouldn't consider my experiences a religious experience. I would consider them more learning and a confirmation that the phenomena exists, that there are little alien beings that could come into your room and take you at any time they want. It's not fun. Kevin has a question. Dave, you're going to bring Carl down with you to visit Las Vegas. Carl the alien. Oh, Carl the alien. Probably not. Probably not. I don't think he'll show up. Too many people, not dark enough. No Tim Hortons. I don't think he's showing up. But I'll tell you, I think he's close. He's getting closer. That I can feel. I haven't seen him in like, holy cow, five years. It's time to see him again, don't you think? So let me get my ice cap and donut first. Let us go to another question from our audience. Max Ritchie is asking, Dave, what are the worst and best outcomes of knowing that ETs are real? Well, I think the best outcome is knowing that we aren't alone in the universe, that they might be able to bring some stability and some technology to maybe allow us the ability to live a little bit longer, maybe the ability to learn new heights, how we can fly with free energy, how we can travel the universe on the blink of an eye, going through wormholes in order to go visit the rings of Saturn or the moons of Jupiter or even further beyond. I think that they are going to open up a lot of things to us spiritually, 
I think they're going to open up the fact that war is not necessary, that we as a human species are actually capable of living together peacefully on this planet. I think they're going to open up a lot of things for us. The worst outcome, the bad aliens come. Yeah. The bad ones who decide they want to serve us for dinner or enslave this planet and just take us all out. Both scenarios are quite true because remember, if they can travel here from another solar system, another galaxy, they have the technology to really hurt us. Do I think that's the case? No. No, I do not. However, never just say I want an experience you don't care what it is. Never say that. Ask for a positive experience. The Michael Leger is asking, do you want to meet them again? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I don't want to do it at night. Okay? I'm tired of this nighttime crap. Tired of it. I want to be able to, this is literally my dream. This is my dream. So for those of you who don't know, my radio studio, SOR headquarters, is built in the basement of my house. I want to walk outside my garage after this show, and I want to see a craft sitting there right on my backyard grass. I got a nice little landing spot for it. And I want to go up to that craft I'm going to walk around it. I want to do the whole James Earl Jones thing before he enters the cornfield in Field of Dreams. I want to look under it. I want to look in it. I want to touch it. And then if there's a stairway, I want to step on those stairs. I want to fly that craft. Lord knows he couldn't make it in the Canadian Armed Forces as a pilot because of my knees. I want that one time, that one time where I can just say, I am the fastest man on earth and take that sucker for a joyride wherever it lets me. And hopefully I don't crash, but if I do crash and end up like a Roswell craft, then that's a good death. That's a good death. Yeah, at least that's what I think. I mean, maybe you think differently, but yeah, I would like to see him again. I would love to go back on a craft, but I'm tired with the nighttime stuff. I think anybody who is experiencing the nighttime stuff, you're done with it. You're done with it. It's old news. It's old hat. You don't want to be able to just go around and go to sleep get finally comfy in your bed. And the next thing you know, there's a few grays knocking on your window saying, Hey, Davey, time to go for a a ride. Don't you think? And you have no control over it. No, you just don't. But yes, I would love to meet them again. And I hope I can be more mature than what I can recall. Hopefully I will be. And hopefully it's not evil because there is always that case. Let's go to the Michael Leger again. Do you think your heart is ready for a conversation with them? Well, it depends on the topic. Like if I had another scenario like I did with Samantha Mowat back in 2014 and they invited us over to talk with them again, I think this time... I would be brave enough. I'm going to use that term brave enough to walk over there and say hello. And by God, if they give me a heart attack, which is possible, then they better save me. They better restart the old ticker. 
because that's not a good death. That one's not a good death. No. No, don't want that one. But I would love to have that conversation. What brings you here? Where are you from? Why me? Why have I been having these experiences? Why did you choose me to contact? Why are you here today? Can I touch your skin? Can I touch your clothing? Are you from the future? Are you from a distant star system? Can we take the ship for a rip? Good Canadian term there. There's a lot of things that I would like to ask. What is the purpose of all this? How long do you live? If I go with you, will I be able to live that long too? Can I bring my kids with me? Is Elvis up there? Or Prince? Or Freddie Mercury? I want to know. Have you found heaven? Is there a heaven? What do you believe in spiritually? Oh, yeah, I have a lot of questions. Lots of questions. It's just a matter of getting the opportunity. But you want to go in consciously. You don't want this nighttime knock you out stuff. Kind of done with that. That's old school. Let's get to another question here. Dave Walters is asking, if there are many types of aliens, would you be sure it would go to the same yin and yang, good and bad? I would hope so. I would totally hope so. Look, I think when you, and many people may not believe me on this, and that's okay. But I truly believe that when you get contacted, you shoot up this beam of light into space that goes off like the Kmart blue light special light. For those of us old enough to remember that, you will know that there was a big time sale about to happen on a Friday night. All of a sudden that blue light lights up and next thing you know, you're getting cans of chunky soup for 99 cents. We're not talking the little cans. We're talking the big, large cans. If you remember that. And I think you put out that signal and that signal can be picked up by the good, the bad, the malevolent, the prosperous, everyone. But it's the intention that you put out, the energy that you put out that can define whether or not you're going to have a good or bad experience. That's my opinion. I could be totally wrong. It's just an opinion that I have. Let's go to Kevin. Dave, have you swapped notes with Whitley Strieber? I have never talked to Whitley Strieber. I have tried many times to get in touch with him. Just never returns the messages. And I want to talk to him because Communion is the only book that I've started reading and never finished because it scared me. I haven't opened my book of communion since about May of 1999. Why? I was holding my daughter, who was just like four or five months old at that time, and I was cuddling her and, and everything, and I'm reading the book while, she, while I'm putting her back to sleep, rocking her. And I get to this point in the book where Whitley goes up on craft and he's sitting on this bench and he looked to the side of him and his son was sitting there stone faced right beside him. And that scared me so bad being a first time new father that I wanted nothing to do with alien contact. Man, that scared me. But here I am now. Here I am now. Let's go to Max. Can you offer a plausible explanation why the ET themselves appear to be part of the overall deception? Why hide the whole truth if you are that powerful? 
Is it a deception, though? If you look at the bigger picture, we maybe they've been coming here for years. You see a lot of extraterrestrials or people report a lot of UFOs that are hovering around volcanoes or go into the volcanoes or go into water, whether it's fresh water or salt water, or go uh, around mines where there's minerals or power facilities. What if they're just flying on by and these types of places light up to them like a spirit of 76 or a an ESO gas station or BP or Petro Canada? What if that's the case? What if they're just here to fuel up or maybe they're taking their family on vacation? Um, kids, we're going down to Earth this time. Oh, Dad, I wanted to go to Mars. Mars is where it's at, Dad. No, nope. none of them party animals at Mars are going to hang out with my kids. We're going to Earth. Maybe that's it. Maybe this whole Galactic Federation thing is true, where there is, like Avi Loeb just said, a giant mothership sitting off there in the distance and they keep sending their probes on down here much like we do in space to investigate life on this planet maybe they over the last hundreds of years just found us but that would only entertain one species not many is there a great deception i don't think so unless you're looking at it from a human side of things. I think the deception comes from governments like the United States, China, Russia, who know a lot more than what they put out there. A lot more. Let's go to Tim. Dave, what if they told you, what if they told you could be the ship conscious, but lose your physical body forever? Oh, that I could turn into the ship but lose my physical body forever. I've seen this naked. I'm taking the ship. This is a, I procreated. The name and the lineage is going to continue. As long as I can take Taco Bell with me, I'm good. It's in case I gotta have some gas power. I'd love to be a ship. Just go flying. Let's go flying. Why not? What's wrong with going on a flight? Who doesn't want to go on a flight? Would you go on a flight if you had that opportunity? Kevin, can you steal something from the ship? Haven't yet. I have not yet. Would I? What do you think? It's not like they, they're going to have brochures or anything. Could you imagine walking on a UFO and all of a sudden you see the the, the tourist section where you could go uh, sign up and for uh, on the local brochure wall for whale watching or tubing or zip lining camping fishing fishing on venus Ock the gray last week just caught a 4500 pound sea tuna got it out of the water he baked it right there in the hot sun could be Brochures on UFOs. Final question, part two. Do you make conscious efforts to get back in touch with the beings you saw before? No, I do not. Why? I'm too tired and don't have time. And I leave that to my good friend, little Marky Spender, a.k.a. Timber Hunter in the chat room. Because if anything's going to go wrong, it's going to be with him. Yeah. He's one of those good friends who blames me for bringing all the weird stuff into his life. It's the way it is, though. What are friends for?
That's all I got to say. What are friends for? Coming up in hour number three of Spaced Out Radio. Hope you enjoyed that. We're going to head to the swamp. Then, Super Duke from World Bigfoot Radio joins us. It's Dave 101 at the bottom of the hour. Lots of Spaced Out Radio coming up next. Great questions, guys. Great questions. I hope you enjoyed that. I I had a lot of fun with that, so thank you. We don't normally get time to do that, so that was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. I'm going to take a quick break here. We'll be right back, and uh, stay tuned. All right, let's say hello to everybody who's come on in late. Gee Calgary, how are you? Parada Radio, good to see you. And who else do we got coming in here late? Uh, let's we Runa Farm, how are you? Good to see you. Hi, Mad Kiwi. It's 8 p.m. Saturday night there already. It's not even Friday here yet. Me Wiken, nice to see you. Rano Er. 
Let's see, who else do we have? Mm, that's about it. Big thank you to our super chatters tonight. Human Carl, Linda, Pam, H, Noble Patrick, Espionage, Maddie, Kim, Lori, Gizmo, Thomas, Plutarchos, Rob, Jenny, Jeremy, Kira, Ange in Australia, and OB Flett. Thank you so, so much for the amazing love tonight, everyone. We appreciate it. We I will be next week in San Francisco for UFOCon 2023. Go to UFOCon2023.com. You can get your tickets there. I'm going to be there. Science Bob's going to be there. Great people like Melinda Leslie, Sev Talk, John Yost, and many others are going to be there hanging on out. And then we want to see you all in Las Vegas for our second annual Vegas fan party. You can get your VIP tickets by going to youtube.com, no YouTube, info at spacedoutradio.com, email cat at info at spacedoutradio.com. Get your tickets locked up. VIP, oh my goodness, VIP tickets are on sale right through April 1st. And we got to get confirmation on those because everybody who's a VIP gets a really, really nice swag bag with a lot of cool goods in there. So we're going to have some fun down there. We want all of you to enjoy it with us as well. And you can get your Spaced Out Radio swag by going to spacedoutradio.com. We got a great store on there with lots of cool stuff on there for you. Here comes hour number three. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Thank you so much for joining us. We very much appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Odyssey Radio, Talk Stream Live, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Join us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Quodamo Dative. Yeah, there it is. I'm not even going to say it again. The Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the news wire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Here we go once again, where we head to the swamp. Our resident swamp dweller takes us on another spooky journey. Hi, Spaced Out Radio listeners. This is Swamp Dweller. It's time for your nightly dose of spookiness on the show. If you have an interesting encounter or a spooky story that you would like to share, be sure to submit them in at swampdweller.net. You can also find our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash swampdwellerreads. Now, let's chill out, relax, and together, let's enter the swamp. The sun was beginning to set as I arrived at the old wooden pier. The sound of the waves lapping against the shore was soothing, and I couldn't wait to cast my line and feel the thrill of reeling in a big catch. The pier that had always been my favorite place to fish with its secluded location and peaceful ambiance. As I set up my gear, I noticed a strange mist from the sea. It was a dense, thick, opaque fog that crept over the pier like a ghostly hand. I shrugged it off at first, thinking it was just the evening chill setting in, but something felt off as I settled into my spot and cast my line. I picked that feeling that I was just being watched. The mist seemed to swirl and shift whenever I glanced around, like a sinister presence lurking beyond my sight. I tried to ignore it the best I could, focusing on my fishing, but the feeling grew more assertive. And then, as I reeled in my line, I caught a glimpse of something in the mist. It was faint. A shadowy figure, if you will. 
like a ghostly form hovering just beyond the fog. At Frost, unsure of really what to do, was it my imagination or was there actually something there? As I watched, the figure grew closer and its features became more distinct. It was a woman with long, dark hair. She was pale, almost translucent in complexion. She floated just above the water, her eyes fixed on me with an eerie intensity. I tried to rationalize it, thinking it was a trick of the light or some sort of reflection in the water. But as the figure grew closer, I could feel the cold, damp air around me, and the hairs on the back of my neck began to stand up. I tried to back away, but before the figure seemed to follow me, its eyes never left mine. She contacted me, trying to communicate something I could not understand. As the mist grew thicker, the figure grew closer, its expression twisting into something dark and menacing. I could feel a sense of dread washing over me, a feeling of impending doom, and then, just as suddenly as it appeared, the figure vanished into thin air. I was left standing there, my heart racing and my mind reeling. Had it been real? Was this just some sort of hallucination brought on by the fog? I hadn't drank, I, I don't smoke, and I definitely got a good night's sleep. As I packed up my gear and headed home, I could not shake the feeling that something was just watching me, something sinister and otherworldly lurking just beyond the veil of reality, and I knew from that day forward I would never be able to fish on that pier again without the fear of that ghostly figure haunting me forever. And that's why we love the Swamp Dweller around here, taking us on journeys just like that to kick off hour number three of this show each and every night. You can hear more of those stories. Just go over to his YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Swamp Dweller Reads, and you can listen to them all for free. From the swamp to the mountains of Montana, where Super Duke from World Bigfoot Radio joins us for the Cryptid Report. <laughs> Oh, I'm doing okay. I'm hanging in there, kind of running on low energy tonight and terrible night for that to happen because I actually have to record a show for <laughs> after I get done on your show tonight. Guest happens to be up in Alaska and he doesn't get off work until late and uh, I drug Robin into this horrible disaster too. So she's doing a 3 a.m. wake up and be on and record. Oh my. And, uh, oh. you know, this is the nice thing about, it. even though you're stuck doing these uh, shows all the time, at least they're in a designated time slot because of my availability and mine are pre-recorded. I can be getting guests from Australia and recording them when they're awake <laughs> at like three or four o'clock in the morning. You know? Right. <laughs> Right. Oh, my goodness. Super Duke, this is the shortened version of everything. You've been taking us on this journey over the last few weeks about uh, Sasquatch and other cryptids being seen around military sightings. But before we get there or wherever you're going to take us, I want to ask you one question, because it was about a year ago now where this young three-year-old boy in Montana was found a couple of miles from his house in a hidden cabin in the forest. Is there any update on that or whether or not anything cryptid was involved with that? No, there hasn't been any indications that there was anything cryptid involved. However, the whole story is still extremely fishy. And some of the details that have come out that are now like part of the canon of the story that everybody repeats are actually incorrect. But I'm too far away to go check it out on the ground. Mike, uh, who does live up there, says that definitely could be Bigfoot activity in that area because there's plenty of woods around there, and they're in an area where it isn't like they got houses right next to them or anything. They're out in the woods, so, you know, definitely could be something like that involved, but we really haven't got anything that we can point directly to and go, ha-ha, here's a strong indicator. They found a track. There's a tree structure in the woods behind their house. Somebody captured a Bigfoot farting on audio. No, we don't have anything. So it's, it would all just be guesswork at this point. 
Right. Right. Well, I thought I would ask. So I, I do appreciate you you talking about that just a little bit here. Where are you taking us tonight there, Super Duke? Uh, well, hey, first of all, before we go there, I sent you another picture. Remember that weird picture I sent you? Did you ever hear anything back on that? Uh, I did take it to a couple of people, uh, three people who are very strong outdoorsmen uh, who looked at it. One said because of the fur on the arms, it it really looked like it might have been somebody in a suit. And the other two were convinced that it was a grizzly bear. Okay. Well, we got another weird one. Again, this was on a tiny channel. It's called uh, uh, Trail Terror. And it's only got like a couple thousand subs. And he's only got like four or five videos out. And he compiles pictures and game cam pictures. And this is another one that looks like same weird critter. Um, so I'm wondering where these things are popping up from because neither one of them has a backstory. The first one was on, uh, uh, was it Dread Captures, I think is the channel that had that on. It's Donovan Dread's op channel. And he basically just does narration of scary stories, much like Swamp Dweller. And he's got this little op channel where he finds weird game cam stuff and puts it up. And that's where the first one showed up. So both of these have appeared with like basically no backstory. And very strange looking. But anyway, while you're checking that out, let me get to some stories here because old Captain Kenny over at the group investigating mystery primates sent us some short reports to go through here. In 1975, a witness lived near Wolf Creek, Oregon, and frequented an isolated swimming hole. One day in July, the witness was washing their hair in the creek when they noticed a head peeking over a fallen log about 60 feet behind them. The witness stood up and yelled, thinking someone was trying to peek at them, but the head disappeared behind the log. The witness then saw a large round head with brownish hair, and the hair on the back of their neck stood up. They felt a sense of panic and a need to flee. When the witness turned around, they saw a tall, hair-covered creature standing upright and melting into the trees. The witness and their friends quickly left the area and searched the hillside across the creek, but saw nothing. The witness had three other encounters in the Wolf Creek area where they heard inexplicable sounds and had the same sensation of panic and hair raising on the back of their neck. The witness is an experienced hiker and has spent several years living in remote areas of Oregon. In a separate incident, about a year before the Wolf Creek encounter, the witness heard heavy footsteps while hiking near Winter, Oregon with their dog and felt threatened and frightened. And the next one... 1981 or 82, during the fall in December, a witness was hunting in East Texas near the Trinity River bottoms and National Forest. While observing a deer through their rifle scope, they saw a large, hair-covered bipedal creature, about 7 feet tall and 275 pounds, they guesstimate, vault over a fence and land on two legs before stepping into the forest. The witness describes the creature as resembling the sketches they had seen of Bigfoot. The sighting lasted about five seconds and occurred around 5 p.m., in clear, cool, and minimal wind conditions. The witness did observe, did not observe, excuse me, any footprints or unusual smells after investigating the area, which they did. The sightings occurred on private land owned by a friend's family and was in the general vicinity of other reported Bigfoot activity in the area. And the next one is in November 1974. Four men were working on a cable logging site on Forest Service land in Curry County, Oregon. Two of the men spotted a creature moving across a prairie about 2,500 feet across the canyon from the yarder. They thought it might have been an elk, but they weren't sure. After telling the yarder engineer about it and asking what he thought it was, the engineer had one of the men retrieve a rifle with a scope out of the uh, crimmy so as to have a better look. Both the yarder engineer and the other man took turns looking at this creature through the rifle scope for about 15 minutes. They both came to the conclusion that this creature was not a bear, elk, deer, or any of the other commonly known big game animals that inhabit these woods around there. The creature was definitely walking upright and on two legs. It had broad shoulders, reddish brown colored hair, and didn't seem to be in any big hurry. Its arms were swinging as it walked, and it seemed to have a pointed or conical-shaped head. They couldn't distinguish the facial features, as it was just too far away. The creature was headed in an east-northeast east direction from them, 
quartering up the hill across the prairie towards the ridge of the hill. They watched the creature until it disappeared over the ridge he was headed towards. On their way home after work, the four men debated what the creature was and concluded that it probably was a Bigfoot. The boys in the brush said they had the feeling that they were being watched for a couple of days, and the hook tender mentioned that uh, he heard noises like sticks breaking and something walking in the brush while he was working at his duties on the back end of the unit. At the time when he heard the noises, he just passed it off as a bear or other game animal. He never mentioned anything with strange odors or anything like that. And we got one more here. This one is... In 1975, a witness lived near Wolf Creek, Oregon, and frequented an isolated swimming hole. One day in July, the witness was washing their hair in the creek when they noticed a head peeking over a fallen log about 60 feet from them. Witness stood up and yelled, thinking someone was trying to peek at them, but the head disappeared behind the log. The witness then saw a large round head to the brownish hair, and the hair on the back of their neck stood up. Wait, did I just read this one? I think so. This one end up being on here twice? I'm sorry. Yeah, it did. That's, That's okay. Fun. That's okay. We got another one to go go to here, which is actually what uh, you want, Dave. Another military report. I love these reports. And yeah, and again, you know, this is just an example for people that think there's no such thing as Bigfoot. How come tons of people are seeing them? And you know, not. It's not just like Jimmy Joe Bob is out there with a quart of brandy, and uh, you know he saw something weird. Uh, these are people from all ages, all walks of life all races, uh, you know, judges, police, firemen, military, all these people have all had Bigfoot sightings. Now, who are you going to get a report from that you want to believe? Do you want a judge to tell you? There's a few of them. You know, Wes Germer on Sasquatch, Sasquatch Chronicles will tell you the same thing, too, because he's had people from every walk of life get a hold of him and tell him their stories. Uh, even, you know, there's a guy in the Senate right now that admits that he had a Bigfoot sighting when he was young. So anyway, this one's at 29 Palms Marine Air Ground Task Force Training Command, San Bernardino County, California. This is a wife's letter. In the early part of 1971, my husband was in charge of the Armory Night Guard. One night, he told me a Marine was found at the rifle range almost incoherent. His rifle bent almost in two. He described what was later to be called the Yucca Man. And I had a local Bigfoot expert on the Yucca Man on my show, uh, Matt Squatch. So if you want to know more about Yucca Man, uh, you can go check out that episode. The guard felt or heard a noise coming from the dark interior of the desert. Upon raising his rifle and shouting the command to halt, the creature came at him, taking the rifle away from him and breaking it in half. The investigation of the area and the guard's description was that of a Bigfoot. From what I remember, federal agents were called in, but I do not know who made that call. There were many civilian dark suits walking around and men in overalls looking for additional information and clues. Local officials that were called in from the neighborhood, excuse me, local officials that were called in from the neighborhood in 29 Palms near the base found out two yucca men were seen that same night, one quite large and a smaller one with it. At the corner of Valley Vista Street and Utah Trail, the residents' dogs continually barked while people looked out their windows trying to see the creature. Further down the same road later on, the creatures were observed near a horse corral where the horses were totally panicked. Another sighting was reported in Joshua Tree National Monument, which is now a park, and the people who cited them were monument employees. This is a desert community not well occupied with people, and most of the area is military base and not accessible. And the author notes here, the yucca plant is a desert cactus type plant of the agave family with stiff sword-like spiked leaves indigenous to the state of California. The term yucca man was coined by the U.S. Marines at the base during the 1980s. Bending the rifle in half uh, was a bit hard to imagine, but the rifle may have been broken at the stock. I wrestle with the idea that it was totally bent in half. Well, the, this author may wrestle with that, but I do not. 
I think perhaps a bit of excited exaggeration occurred in the retelling. I am not convinced of that. On to the next one. 29 Palms Marine Base. Uh, Mojave Sandman and Morongo Valley Monster are but a few of the names the soldiers have over time given Bigfoot-like life forms that walk the desert at night. Other names, the Huli Bully Man, Big Spike, and the Charlie Creature, a term that might have been a holdover nickname from the Vietnam conflict where they called the enemy Charlie. The next email came in 2005. Quote, my brother, dead now from a brain tumor, was once a Marine NCO stationed in the Mojave Desert at the Marine Corps Air Guard Combat Center at 29 Palms, California. I remember hearing Jack tell a story about a breach in the perimeter that caused some concern. Jack called it the Mojave Sandman. This was in 1991. Since that time, I've heard the creature called the Morongo Valley Monster. Have you heard of that one? Whatever the no. damn thing was. <laughs> oh, excuse me. This is what she's writing. Whatever the, uh, the damn thing was, my brother said it was big, hairy, and a frequent visitor to the base. It seemed to travel up from Joshua Tree North directly through the base toward the Mojave Preserve and always at night between 0200 and 0300. Temps out there in the day fluctuate between 120 degrees. <laughs> yeah. To nope. a, a low of 10 degrees in the winter. This one time, he recalled, was in a blistering sandstorm, the kind that strips the paint off your car, and here comes the hair-covered sandman right on time, up from the south, heading north, the way it always went with no apparent regard for the sting of the blowing with sand. Jack always thought that odd. When Jack reported the breach, he was ordered not to engage it. Next one. My name is Kenneth. I live near Pawnee, Nebraska, June 2005. The remark intrigued me is that it was not only interesting why the sandstorm didn't rip the hide off the Sasquatch, but how it is the big hairy man was able to tolerate the pain. Sandstorms can be brutal. Never mind how hard it is to breathe in a sandstorm of that intensity. Similarly, field men have tracked trails of footprints in deep snow that were barefooted and even frozen feet in icy conditions seem not to bother the Sasquatch. Yeah, I can confirm that. I'm not convinced conditions play a huge role in such situations. Is it possible some of these Sasquatches are impervious to certain levels of pain? Okay. How much time we got left, Dave? We have two minutes. Two minutes. Don't think we can get through that one. Oh, here's a short one. Here we go. White Sands, Missile Range, Alamogordo, New Mexico. The last letter regarding military base sightings occurred before there was any publicity regarding hair-covered Bigfoot. At the time, they were called Abominable Snowmen. The letter was only partially recovered from my oldest computer, vintage in 1989. Pieced it together as best I could for this purpose. Came from H.L. Seeds Norton, who claimed to have had a security clearance at the White Sands Missile Range in the late 1940s during the establishing of the complex for early day testing rocket and missile technology. The facility at White Sands is a huge complex northeast of Las Cruces, New Mexico, all the way north just south of Albuquerque. To the east of Alamogordo, situated at the edge of the Lincoln National Forest. To the west, Gila, Jibola, Apache National Forest. This provides plenty of daytime cover for the big hairy guys. Nicknamed the Shooter by construction crews, Norton wrote about civilian employees there at the White Sands Missile Range who quit after a nightmarish hour of screaming heard emanating out of the desert floor someplace. At some point, a spotlight was shown on the screamer. <clears throat> Excuse me. who then shot across the desert like they said, quote, Wiley Coyote, in the Roadrunner cartoons of the 40s and 50s, thus the nickname. There was virtually no public discussion in the media about hair-covered wild life forms in the 1950s, so it makes sense that the sights and sounds of what must have been a Bigfoot-like entity seemed like hellish monsters to the Mesoamerican laborers hired to pour concrete slab foundations at White Sands. If there's current activity there, this author hadn't heard about it, but would not be surprised. So there is some military encounters for it. I love them. I love them. It makes me wonder. Makes me wonder. Super Duke from World Bigfoot Radio. Outstanding work once again. We'll let you get to your 
program that you got to go record for big world bigfoot central and go have some fun my friend and stay up late and watch out for them wookies man don't hug them don't hug the wookies all right super Duke for world bigfoot radio coming up next it's dave 101 drama in the paranormal television world yeah we're going to talk about that next on spaced out radio stay tuned beauty good job super duke hey how do you like the design up here the uh the, love it this, this side <laughs> let me point love it there it. that one that is love a local that. missoula bigfoot design remember i was telling you about how like everywhere around here this is one of the local eight designs nice. that they have available in, in missoula right now and it says last best place get lost <laughs> nice love it so yeah if you guys notice my backdrop the t-shirt designs will change every so often i'm hanging up t-shirts as posters so you get to see different ones all the time i love it i love it all right buddy we'll let you go have a busy night and say hi to robin for us oh uh, absolutely will uh, actually this is going to be fun because she was on the phone when these guys were doing two two weeks worth of research it was uh daniel becker and william lunsford who's been on your show yeah. And they're out in the field doing this live research. And every time they started getting spooked, they'd call Robin on the other side of the country to ask her what was going on. <laughs> and Dave, you know that works out. So it was, you know, Very although true. hilarious, yeah, it works. <laughs> Very true. All right. Anyway, All right. I'm, I'm out of here. I want to go see you yell about the aliens getting off your yard. Get out of my lawn, you Get out of my lawn, you damn probe happy saucer jockey bastages. <laughs> Love it. See you. See you guys. See you, buddy. That's Super Duke from World Bigfoot Radio. Tits McGee filling in for the vacationing Veronica Corning Stone. <clears throat> Love it. Love it. Baxter. Oh, Baxter. My Baxter. John Sabe Melon, how are you, man? I mentioned Tits McGee that I, out of all the YouTube chat rooms you go in, I'm probably one of the only ones, only host that has picked that up. I'll guarantee you. Thank you tonight to Thomas times two, Obi Flett, Ange in Australia, Kira, Jeremy, Jenny, Rob, Plutarchos, Gizmo, Lori, Kim, Maddie, Carl, Linda, Pam H, Noble Patrick, and Espionage for the amazing super chats. Thank you so much. Very much appreciate the love and support, guys. Very much appreciate it. Alien 101, welcome to SOR Chat. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Tits McGee, if that happened, I would probably faint. I would probably faint. All right. Uh, what can I say here? We got about one minute to go. 
Who's coming to Vegas? Put your hands up if you're joining us for the Las Vegas fan party. May 19th through 21st at the Golden Nugget. If you've registered with us, hi, Aiden, how you doing? If you've registered with us and you haven't got back to us about VIP tickets or regular tickets, please do so at info at spacedoutradio.com. You said you're coming, so make sure you do that because we want to see you there. And we need the VIP tickets all purchased up by April 1st. We got a great list for everybody to meet up with. And they're all coming to see you guys. That's what they're coming for. They're coming on their own dime to see all of you. So make sure you get registered on up. Info at spacedoutradio.com. Info at spacedoutradio.com. And let's go with the final half hour right now. We rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Very much appreciate earning your listening ears. I want to remind you that if you miss most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read the Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. It is time once again where I yell at the crowd to get off my lawn. It is time for the Dave 101. All right, there is drama in the paranormal poolside right now where Travel Channel is apparently about to gas a number of shows, cancel them outright, and many are blaming the beloved star of Ghost Adventures, Zach Bagans. Well, let me tell you that old Zachy Poo doesn't have a lot of friends right now after being a producer for many of these shows, and apparently... Here are the list of shows that seem to have been canceled for next year. Destination Fear. There is a a, a real, real upsetting uh, person on that team by the name of Dakota Layden. Yeah, he's pretty upset. Actually went on and did a TikTok and an Instagram post saying, did Zach Bagans cancel destination fear well who knows but apparently there are other shows that are on the rocks as well they include kindred spirits ghost brothers portals to hell and the previously canceled holzer files that starred our good friend dave schrader now bagans doesn't make uh, uh, all the decisions no but apparently many like nick groff believe He is an accomplice to many of these shows cutting in to what is allegedly his popularity. My suggestion is this. Let's gas them all. Look, I love paranormal television. I do. It's entertaining. It's fun. You learn a few things. We all got interested in this field because of what we saw on television the last 20 years, starting with Paranormal State on A&E. 
But Travel Channel has really banked on paranormal programming. And now cutting popular shows really isn't sitting well with many of these people who are blaming Bagans. Now, I don't know Zach Bagans, never met him, never shook his hand, never seen him in public. Okay, he doesn't do interviews, which is why we've never had him on this show, but that's irrelevant. I got an idea. And if there's any television people out there lurking around, how about listening to dear old Dave here for a couple of minutes? Your programming sucks. Let me explain why your programming sucks. Because all you do is take different people, put them on different channels, different shows with different titles to do the exact same locations as every other freaking team out there. There's no originality. You can't hear anything because they have the background noise up so high that all we get is, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Did you, did you, did you, did you, did you hear that? Right? I mean, it's getting ridiculous. Every show is the same, going to the same locations. And you know what? As a viewer, I'm tired of Bobby McGee's. I'm tired of Gettysburg. I'm tired of Alcatraz. I'm tired of every insane asylum between New York State and Washington State. There is nothing original about doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over. And that's all we see. There's never any answers. There's never any solutions. And it's mind-numbing. Gee, if I just spent an hour watching Ghost Adventures, why should I watch any other show if I'm going to get the exact same thing? At the same location, two weeks later. You're telling me that the only hot spots, the only places that are high that are haunted in the US are the same ones we see on every television show. Come on. Where's the originality? Where is the fun in this? As stupid as Finding Sasquatch was where everything to Bobo was a squatch. At least they were trying things and they didn't care. They looked stupid, like bringing out a drum set into the forest. I don't feel sorry for any of these television shows. I feel sorry for the people because that is their income. That is their lifeline. All right. Many of them have been able to parlay that into things like tourism cruises and other supplements of income, which is great. Okay. I've also met a number of these people and would say quite a few of them have egos bigger than athletes making $40 million a year to play quarterback in the NFL or $10 million a year to play in the NHL. Why do you have an attitude? Because you're on television? Wow. Amazing. You're the best. And you do everything the exact same way as everybody else. The sad part about it is there is so much talent out there in the paranormal world with great ideas. And this is why I liked Dave Schrader's The Holzer Files is because they told us a story. They told us about Hans Holder. They brought in history. They brought in a number of things. And I'm not just saying that because Dave is a friend of this show, but he got ripped off on that one. Ratings were up. 
things were doing great, and they had the wool and the rug pulled from under them. But these other shows, nah, they're all the same. They're all the same. I'm surprised that they don't just switch wardrobes on many of these channels between shows. Oh, you wore that plaid short sleeve shirt last week. Well, pass it over here. We're going to put it on this guy over here in two weeks time. That's it. That's all we see. So why am I griping on this? Because I want our subjects to be better. We're not pushing ourselves to be better. We're not pushing ourselves on what works. And Zach Bagans, by the way, not everything is a demon. Okay. How about finding some locations and telling us some stories? I can name three great things right now that I would love to see happen. Number one, we in North America have this beautifully haunted Gold Rush Trail. That's literally three quarters of a mile behind my back here as I speak to you. Haunted as anything. Starts in Nevada and California, makes its way all the way up to Alaska. What about a series on that? What about a series on haunted battlefields? Yes, Gettysburg would come up again. But haunted battlefields in North America. There were plenty of them. What about a series on local legends where you get a team of investigators who go around looking for local legends in small towns that would never in their wildest dreams get television time? Why aren't we thinking outside the box when it comes to this? Why? Because in paranormal television land, if it's good for one, it's good for all. But I'm here to tell you it's not. And it's going to be interesting to see what the Travel Channel does in order to make this up. There are so many fresh, new, and hidden locations around North America and the world for that matter that will never ever get their stories told and for many of those towns probably within the next 50 to 100 years they're probably going to be ghost towns and nobody is going to take the story and run with it why not this is what we want i know an abandoned town here in british columbia that everyone thinks is haunted and terrorized by a monster. Guess where Merle and I are going this summer. But the repetitiveness that we have seen over the last 18, 20 years, it's tiring. And how do you take them seriously when these professional ghost hunters never find an answer to everything? You know, one of my favorite things is about paranormal TV And it started with the original Ghost Hunters series where they would go, they would spend a couple of days in a location. No, this place isn't haunted. Well, you aren't there when the ghosts are active. Seriously. You can't just do things and expect the ghost to show up because you want them there. That's not how the dead work. Look, I, I've ran a ghost tour for three years at my local museum to help raise money for it. And there were days where every building was incredibly haunted. And we had days where there wasn't so much as a sneeze from something strange. You couldn't even hear a mouse squeak in the corner because you can't tell the ghost to just show up and perform 
like paranormal television has got you to think. But in their minds, the place isn't haunted if the ghosts aren't there. No, we've all had enough of paranormal TV. They've spent and made, the Travel Channel that is, millions of dollars upon millions of dollars in bringing this type of programming to you. It reminds me of what my dad said about exotic dancers. When I asked him when I was 19 years old, Dad, will you come to the peelers with me? No, son. Why are you wasting your time? Well, Dad, there's going to be naked girls on stage. I understand that, son, but when you've seen them one, you've seen them all. At 19, that was the most unrealistic statement that I had ever heard. But by 25, my father was right. Everyone was the same. And it was a waste of money and a waste of time. So the point that I'm getting that is, if we want better television, Travel Channel needs to open up their doors, open up their eyes, and see that there are some great people out there with even greater ideas that deserve a shot on television, and I bet you their ratings would take off. I bet you they would. Let's see if they shut down the entire paranormal game, or let's see if they actually do some work and start getting creative once again. Because I will tell you right now, Travel Channel, you're boring. And your television shows suck. That is your Dave 101. Tell me what you think if you're on YouTube and watching this on YouTube. Leave a comment below. I'm always curious what our audience thinks. And what's your opinion? Is it time for change in paranormal TV? I think so. Let's get to the news. What time is it? It's time for Shirky Pink's News. Yes, let's get right to it. Starting off in Utah, where this gentleman really wanted to get himself arrested. Yeah. Utah police said Donna, Donald Sacroce, who's 65 years old, was arrested after he allegedly demanded $1. Yes, you heard that right. $1 from bank employees and then refused to leave. He allegedly entered a Wells Fargo bank near 300 South Main Street in Salt Lake City on Monday morning and presented a note to the bank tellers that read, Please pardon me for doing this, but this is a robbery. Please give me $1. Thank you. The employees complied and asked Santa Croce to leave, but he refused. He even allegedly told employees to call police and then sat down and waited for them. Santa Croce allegedly said that if he gets out of jail, he'd rob another bank and ask for more money until he was sent to federal prison. It's not clear why he is so adamant about going to the federal penitentiary. He was booked into Salt Lake County Metro Jail on a felony robbery charge, but was later released. I bet you the guy just wants three square meals and a bed a day. I bet you that's what it is. I've heard of this happening before. These guys out there on the streets, it's tough. They don't want to be around the boozers. They don't want to be around the drug addicts. All they want is a warm bed and three square meals a day. Or maybe they can't afford dental surgery that you get in prison or health care, and they got something wrong. Could be a number of experiences. I feel bad for that guy. I really do. An Illinois man has reportedly been found dead in his own home several months after his wife reported him missing. That missing man named Richard Mage died by suicide, according to the report by Madison County Coroner Steve Noon. There was no suspicion of foul play, and he had no other injuries. His remains were mummified when he found when he was found. Despite complaints of a foul odor in the house and three police searches, one with cadaver dogs, 
Mange's body was not located until the dead man's wife, Jennifer, looked into a concealed closet for Christmas decorations. The Madison County Chief Deputy Coroner, Kelly Rogers, said police had described the house as a hoarder's type of home. This likely hindered a thorough search. Police had reported a sewer-like smell in the house when they first searched the property, and Jennifer asked them to search again when she, too, smelled something off. Mage reportedly uh, reported her husband missing on April 27, 2022, and his body was found eight months later in December. When reporting that he was missing, Jennifer told police she had spoken to her husband the day before he disappeared. He had told her he was leaving work early, but for all she knew, he never came back home again. His car, wallet, and keys were all in the house, and this case is still under investigation, and that Mage's sister, Marilyn Tolliver, has expressed her unhappiness with the way the case was handled. She wants answers from the police as to how the search for her brother was conducted. Gross. Patricia Copta left her behind a husband and siblings and meandered through Island before being taken to an adult care home in 1999. This is a weird one, too. A Pennsylvania woman who went missing more than 30 years ago in a case that has stumped authorities has later been declared, or she was later declared legally dead. Well, she's been found living in a nursing home in Puerto Rico. Patricia Compta left behind her husband and siblings. Uh, that's when she meandered through northern Puerto Rico for a while before she was taken as a person in need to an adult care home. Copta, once known as a street preacher in her hometown, initially kept her past secret while in Puerto Rico, but she began to divulge details as she suffered progressively from dementia, according to Ross Township Deputy Police Chief Brian Colehap. Yeah, by last year, a social worker at the home had enough information to alert authorities back home that the now 83-year-old woman was still alive, and they proved it through a DNA test. Outstanding. Outstanding. And finally, Maydell Taylor Hawkins just turned 98, and she welcomed in her 622nd grandchild. The Kentucky matriarch has been photographed with her daughter, great-granddaughter, great-granddaughter, great-great-granddaughter, and great-great-great-granddaughter in a picture of six generations that has no surplus. It's gone viral. Talk about a huge family. 222 great-grandchildren, 234 great-great-grandchildren, 37 great-great-great-grandchildren spread out around the USA. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in in our chat room tonight and at work, at home, in your cars, wherever you may be. In our chat rooms, LinkedIn, YouTube, LGAP, Facebook, Spreaker, Twitch, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter, at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Space Down Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us, because together, my friends, make a mistake. We're watching Beyond the Night, Mister Bumblefoot. We need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. You know, I'm not going to lie. It was nice to rant on the paranormal for a while. 
Hasn't been a lot of paradrama recently. So I'm pretty happy about that. Pretty stoked. We don't do a lot of paranormal around here. We just don't. We need to do more. I would love to do more, but everything is the same. Do you think I was off the hook there for a little bit on that one? What's your thoughts? It's, it all, it's always the same. I don't want the same anymore. The same locations. The same. Did you hear that? Did you see that? Did you hear that? Did you see that? It's kind of old. I know I'm sounding whiny about it. <clears throat> But it's annoying. Chill Farm, aren't you supposed to be signing autographs right now? How do you have time to comment? Hey, Ross Dog's Broken Spirit. I just want to know what agency you work for. Are you NSA too? I don't know where a random guy is tonight. I hadn't heard from him today. If he was Quebecois, he'd be random Guy. That would be funny. Maybe I'll call him random Guy tomorrow. Hey, random Guy. Bonjour. Comment ça va? Random Guy. That would be funny, actually. Look at Nicole Sackett stirring it up. The paranormal needs a Twitterverse war. Nobody needs that. Well, IJ, that would be a good idea. I'll tell you, I'm going to this year do a little bit more filming. My big thing right now that I want to, I want to get this year is I want to ooh, uh, get a uh, trailer. So that way I'm not having to run home all the time. This dude is out to lunch a hole, a, a hole the size of an orange. He would be dead. Grifter. Oh, what, what are you talking about? Telling it like it is. I don't know what you're, what you're discussing there. What beings are demons? Is this Zach Bagans? Are you Zach Bagans where everything is a demon? You worm, what's happening?
Looney. What's happening there, Dollar? Where are you going on tour, YJ? See, that's a good one, Ross Dogs. That's an adventure. That's the stuff that needs to be on TV. Find the location of Albert Osman's Sasquatch kidnapping. That's a great show or documentary. That's the kind of ideas that we need to see on television. Right? That's totally it. I would watch that. I would totally watch that. Uh, have I heard of a worm parasitic entity? Hey, YJ, you're going to stop down at my place? Go for lunch, dude. Or you head north. Now you're not going to head north. The weather's going to be worse down there. You're heading. You're heading south. You got to pass my house. Uh gee, I wouldn't do that one. The pig farm. Uh, you can't even get there right now, and most of it has been subdivided, and it's all private property. Uh, data, I'll be honest with you. I haven't even looked at it. Don't hate me for it, but I haven't even looked at it. I apologize. I just, my time is so limited for me to watch videos. It's really, really hard for me. I will try to get to it. Okay. I will really try. When are you leaving, YJ? Thanks, Warden. Uh, what did I think about John George Knapp's comments about John Greenwald? Um I'm going to just say this because I like both of them, but I had a good laugh. I could understand the sarcasm of George and I could understand where Greenwald feels offended, but I laughed. I laughed. I mean, I probably would not have used the sex toy story. Okay. 
or the sex toy comment, I probably would have used something different. <sighs> Excuse me. But it is what it is. I'm really surprised we saw George Knapp react, though, because for years, George Knapp has been attacked by people and he never re reacts. He never reacts. Okay. But our, you know what? I'm going to take a quick break here and I, and I will go over a point. I do have a point that I want to make here um, regarding this. So. Let me find you a channel to look at here. El Donio. What's happening in El Donio? No, that's Avatar. Bloody angel. That's not El Donio. Okay, stop. Oh, this is cool. There you go. Oh, before I do that. Look at all the animals. Look at them all. Gazelle, zebras, one elephant, and somewhere hiding around there, one drunken warthog or wildebeest. Yeah. Question is, what is that way in the background? In the middle by the green trees. Well, that's more zebras. Oh, goodness. You aren't seeing squat right now because I haven't brought them in. There they are.
Oh no. Why'd it freeze? Why'd it freeze? Hold on. Convert. There we go. No, it's not frozen. That is one massive elephant. Who's on the show tomorrow night? Rich Hoffman from the SCU joins us tomorrow night. We're going to get into nuts and bolts ufology. Is it really worth the study? What are they missing? What are they trying to do? What are all these groups doing? We're going to find out tomorrow night. Rich Hoffman is our guest. It's going to be good. Any questions? Why, Jay, that's a good uh, analogy. Uh, I'm not going to ask him about the UAPX mess. I will ask him about Enigma Labs. Yes, Sherry, that would be amazing if all of a sudden a UFO like landed and took that big elephant up. That would be awesome. Uh, I've never been to Vermont. Um, I would love to go there, but no, I've never done any sort of investigating there. Uh, Stu, did Chris Bledsoe bail early? Yeah, he bailed a half an hour early because he wasn't feeling very well. I thought we were only going to get an hour out of him, but we got an hour. Oh, goodness, my chair. Uh, but we got an hour and a half out of him. So I'm pretty happy with that. Oh, and Oryx moved in there. Isn't that nice? Nice little oryx there. Uh, 
That elephant is huge. No, it's glitching because I'm downloading or uploading uh, the radio shows to our our radio station. So that's why it's uh, glitching. Any other questions for dear old Davey? Oh, here come the drafts. Uh, Patrick, I, I haven't even weighed myself. I, uh, I got to get to the gym and weigh myself again. Uh, the snow outside my house depends on the area In my backyard, which doesn't get a lot of sun. I'm still at about almost three feet front of my house that gets a lot of sun, probably a few inches. Oh, Sherry. That's awesome. Good night, Warden Dragon. Uh, Dave, how do you think up so many great questions with such a large variety of guests? Uh, Maggie, the secret is don't write down any questions. And listen to what the guest is saying. Because the guest will literally feed you your next question. Uh, Thurston, have you had Carl leave a symbol in your body? No, Carl's only been here twice and he hasn't been around since 2018. Mr. Underhill on Twitch. Come join us on YouTube sometime. So the rest of the chat can meet up with you. All right, guys, I want to say a big thank you to Human Carl, Linda, Pam H., Noble Patrick, Espionage, Maddie, Kim, Lori, Gizmo, Thomas Times 2, Plutarchos, Rob, Jenny, Jeremy, Kira, Ange, and Obi Flett for the amazing super chats tonight. Very much appreciate the love and support. 
Thank you so, so much. Once again, tomorrow night, Rich Hoffman will be on the show. Nuts and bolts about UFOs. And remember, if you are planning on going to Vegas and you are planning on getting VIP, uh, oh, thank you for that super chat, Chill Farm. Uh, I appreciate you also signing the autographs after the show. Very much appreciate that. Um, if you are getting the VIP passes, we really do need to know within the next few weeks because we we are basing all of our our purchases of the swag bags, including T-shirts and everything, off of how many people are going. So that's why we have to get a number for everybody. So if you could, I would appreciate it and get a hold of us at info at spacedoutradio.com. And for all the rest of you, have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. healthy my friend you too you need bail money give me a call always dad take care (laughs) you too